Yo. Yo, let's go. What up, y'all? <laughs> Shouts out to all my homies out there. What's going on, everybody? Okay, hope you got me here because my connection died and then it came back. So hopefully we're good. All right, what's up, y'all? Today we are doing um, uh, the biography of Aleister Crowley called Do What Thou Wilt by Lawrence Sutton. And um, I've read this book um, this is a couple times um, and I just decided, you know, let's cover it because um, I guess we'll dive into it right now. I mean, my thesis statement for this book essentially – um, is that, you know, his own thesis statement is, is that, okay, well, uh, it's pretty interesting because he essentially says, you know, that Crowley is a, is a, um, you know, some will say that he's a misunderstood character, right? He's a misunderstood figure, but it doesn't help that his own, that he worked so hard, um, to cultivate the image that he did. So he tries to just give a, you know, fair and balanced, whatever. Um, uh, my, my thesis statement is that, um, that he is, uh, the things that we, you know, that we, that we say, um, he was, and that a lot of the, uh, especially the nastier, um, things about him, um, are not metaphor. They are literal. And I think that, um, my, my purpose of going over this book is essentially that, we, I think, you know, we all know if you're watching this now, um, you may be watching this later, especially, and you may, um, you know, uh, not know about uh, Aleister Crowley or, or maybe, you know, maybe, you you know, you're a scholar um, on, on his, him and his work and, you know, the, the era and everything. Um, and maybe this is just for fun, refresher. Um, I would say that everybody in my, you know, I have such a high IQ audience. I think that everybody, you know, knows about Aleister Crowley. Everybody knows, you know, all the stories. But I think it's important that, like you know, like with the literature that we've done, that we go back and look at the text, um, and and just sort of not only refresh ourselves, but look at um, what's the actual source material. Look at some of the text um, and decipher um, some things for ourselves. I mean, you know, no matter how much you know a subject, it always I think helps to go back and rediscover some of the literature. Um, and I think that. I think that, you know, we'll find that, um, that yes, uh, you know, in my, in my opinion, um, Aleister Crowley was, um, he was, you know, what he, what we say, what we think that he was, he was a magician. Um, he was an occult figure. He was a Gnostic. Um, he was also highly influential. Um, we know that. I mean, look, I would say that my overall thesis would be that, you know, the new aeon that Aleister Crowley sort of, we, you know, we read about and the, the Gnostic Thelema, the OTO elements of the occult um, and ushering in the, you know, the crown and conquering child and all that stuff. I think that essentially that, you know, uh, in many ways we see the fruits of his, you know, dark work um, in terms of uh, the culture, media, politics. He had a wide range of associates um, and was, as we know, highly influential. And obviously I don't agree with that. I don't, I don't agree with, you know, I don't like, I don't like him, obviously. Um, I think that it's important to study this though, because, and read about it because uh, we have to know where we are, what we're, uh, you know, what we're up against, so to speak. Um, and, uh, and I think it's just, uh, it's interesting just to go back and, and look at some of these things. And, you know, I think that people that sort of knock off, Crowley and the like and say, you know, he's a charlatan. Well, yeah, of course he was a charlatan. I mean, that's, that's part of the, the thing. He was a charlatan, but that doesn't mean that he also wasn't real, that, that, that the things that he wanted and worked for and said um, didn't occur or didn't up, end up um, occurring. Um, and so I think it's important to, you know, it's not necessarily an either or situation. I think it's important to understand these things um, so that we can recognize uh, truth Right. So um, this is a particularly I, I, you know, I think this is a particularly um, well-written book. I have my problems with it, but I, but but this is a pretty good book. I also have um, we won't be covering these today. We're just so today we're just covering we're looking at the early, essentially the early life. Everybody, you know, we always hear about the the later life of Aleister Crowley. His, his life is sort of in, I would say, in, in sort of a 
a, a three section. We, we could have a three sectioned um, life of Crowley. And, you know, we could always talk about his, his later life, especially his latter years, you know, as a, as a heroin addict and stuff. And that again is like an era where he sort of brushed off as like this broken old man who's not doing anything. I don't think that's true either. Um, we also have the middle section of his life, which would be, um, you know, we've got, uh, we're kind of, we're, we're going to end it, the stream up at about the point where um, the espionage elements come into it. And yes, and Jethro has, has of course linked um, right there. One of JD's uh, great streams on crowd JD and, and Isaac, of course, shouts out to Isaac. Um, uh, Why well, saw uh they did a stream on uh, Crowley and Marjorie Cameron. Um, Jay also did the stream on uh, with the author of this book, um, Spence, who did um, uh, they did a uh, stream uh, an old one a while back, and a great interview on um, Alistair Crowley's uh, espionage elements um, and connections um, with the British establishment and with um, and yes, and with espionage. So go watch that one. That was great, of course, as always. Um, and so we're going to end the, it'll end right about where that started. Um, what we're going to cover today is the young Alistair Crowley, the life of, of, of Harry Potter, essentially, AKA the story of the young Alistair Crowley, um, which I think is probably more truthful than people will, will let on, but that is an interesting element. Yeah. We're going to talk about, uh, the, um, the British establishment, the Plymouth Brethren, um, Crowley's, you know, long, young life with the Ply uh, Plymouth Brethren, all of the nefarious and the sort of sick deeds that um, he did and that he talked about involving the cat and all that stuff that we know. Um, we're going to talk about his life at Cambridge um, and in the British public school system um, and his occult esoteric roots. Then we're going to get into Cambridge and the Golden Dawn. We'll talk about William Butler Yeats. And it's interesting going back and, you know, we've done uh, William Butler Yeats, of course, uh, we did a stream on Yeats and the second coming. And, you know, I know the poem, the second coming, um, it's, I would say, you know, I, I know it well. Okay. And, um, it's always interesting to go back and look at, especially in this book, talking about Crowley and Yeats and their sort of magical, their magical battle, um, in the golden dawn and how there are obvious elements of Crowley in Yeats. I mean, Yeats, it's not, this isn't like an overdone story. Yates knew Crowley. Um, they knew each other very well. And, um, and they had a, there was a relationship. There was a breaking off. There was a whole thing. And I think that, again, a lot of people, not necessarily critics, but people who may not, pe people who may know Crowley's work very, you know, well, will sort of brush off a lot of these relationships that he had with a wide, a wide range of circle of people. Now, part of that I understand is that as a member of the British aristocracy, you know, he's, he's part of the establishment. <laughs> um, and he was, I mean, he was, he was wealthy. He was well-to-do. He was sort of a Victorian well-to-do, not necessarily, um, you know, a British establishment elite, but he definitely did know elites. Um, he wasn't necessarily one of them in terms of what we in America would, you know, call old money. But he, um, it was more of a, you know, an industrial era, industrial revolution, Victorian sense of money. But he had money, um, he had influence, and he knew a lot of people. Uh, we're going to talk about his life, his traveling, and we're going to sort of end it with um, where he starts to compose the Book of the Law, and all that, you know, and all that stuff in Egypt. And uh, we're going to really get into like what the actual text says. So I think this will be cool. This will be, um, you know there's so much to say about Crowley and there's so many elements involved like in his life and all the things that he did that oftentimes stories can get convoluted. Um, we can confuse one story with another. I mean, that happens, you know, that happens to, to all of us. So I think it's important to go back and, and look at the text. So again, um, another book I would say uh, that's enlightening about Crowley is um, and his uh, occult and intelligence ties would be this book by Spence, um, Secret Agent 666. Um, and of course, again, Jay did an interview on that. Um, Blavatsky, um, good guy, <laughs> Jason, shouts out to Jason there. Um, Blav yeah, Blavatsky obviously plays a big part in Crowley. And um, Blavatsky is a, she precedes 
Crowley. Crowley himself thought that he was the re, you know, he was the not the reincarnation per se, but that he was the spirit of Eliphas Levi and all these people. But Novotsky, yes, will play a big role um, in Golden Dawn and in Crowley's own uh, development of his, you know, magical thinking and all this stuff. Um, another book is uh, Alistair Crowley, Magic, Rock and Roll in the Wickedest Man in the World by, by Gary Lockman. And this is, a, I enjoyed this book. I thought it was, this, this is not necessarily the kind of book that we're reading now today um uh because whenever i shove the book in the screen of course it starts to wobble so i'm sorry about that um but it's a book that deals more with um the rock and roll influence and elements that came from crowley of course with the beatles uh david bowie ozzy osbourne etc they go much deeper than that it's not just those you know those three big ones i think david bowie is probably david bowie I think David Bowie is probably the most uh, misunderstood, you know, mis not misunderstood, the most misread in terms of misunderstanding of Crowley because because Bowie is almost pure Crowleyite or Crowleyan. Um, and I think that uh, most people will talk about the Beatles and, you know, um, the winged beetle. A shout out to Kristen out there at um, Slow Boy Whiteboard who uh, posted a video on the occult and maybe it was zeppelin um but those videos and we watched it actually on on jd on jay's uh, stream remember that um most people don't understand that led zeppelin right there's a whole series called um the winged beetle and for those that don't know remember the the beatles i mean the winged beetle is essentially um the symbol of horus that uh, yeah, exactly. Exactly. WLM. Um, it's essentially the symbol of Horus that uh, Crowley was, you know, magnetized to during the uh, composition of the Book of the Law. And and obviously John Lennon knew, you know, Alistair knew about Alistair Crowley. Knew, um, they, they put him on the cover of the of Sergeant Pepper. We know that. Uh, but there's a lot more to it. And don't forget. We've done a stream on um, Jack Kerouac, on New Jack Kerouac City. Shouts out to Jethro um, and his uh, cringe work that he did for me, um, which was awesome. So you guys uh, check that out, my my New Jack Kerouac City uh, stream. But remember that the Beatles were also, they, they spelled the Beatles, Beatles instead of the bug Beatle. It's B-E-A-T because of Beat Generation. That was his influence on that. Now, of course... I haven't even mentioned Led Zeppelin and, you know, anybody who knows anything knows about Jimmy Page's um, obsession. And I would say almost certainly continuing obsession life with, uh, with, you know, Aleister Crowley in terms of, you know, OTO and all that stuff. I mean, I saw an interview recently where he was questioned about it. It recently in terms of like it was in the last 10 years. And they said, oh, what about Aleister Crowley and the occult? And he kind of brushes it off. But but see, that's part of it. I mean, the occult is hidden. And I think that um, there's even a section in the book where they talk about uh, Aleister Crowley's own writing. You know, he was a prol prolific writer. If you've read any of Crowley's own writing, his, you know, 777, Leave Our Oz, all that shit. Um, but... Um, in his own writing, you know, he he incorporates these things called blinds, right? Um, and a blind in terms of occult writing is sort of a, a red herring. It's a throwaway. It's meant to lead the reader who knows the true path, which, of course, would probably be the left-hand path, which would be a false path, but whatever, um, into the, you know, through the labyrinth, into the, you know, through, through uh, along the Kabbalistic route or whatever, and through Jacob and Boaz into the, the light of illumination of gradation or grades. Um, so it's not unusual that occultists like Jimmy Page will, will deflect when talking about it. But remember that Jimmy Page, you know, by, I've got, uh, I think every Zeppelin biography I've got, um, and I've read multiple times and, and every single one uh, will talk blatantly about Page's, um, obsession with Alistair Crowley. Remember, he put, he purchased Bolskin House on the shores of Loch Ness. So, some say that 
Um, some say that uh, Bolskin House itself is uh, that, that Crowley for uh, the Loch Ness monster that he raised during the um, the uh, what was he doing the Opera Melon ritual that he actually conjured the Loch Ness monster. I don't know about that. I I, I don't think it's a joke in terms of. I think that I I do think that he was a capable sorcerer. And what I mean is that I think that it's important to understand when talking about the occult, that a lot of these things happen, that they're true. We know that. Um, and that's especially true when we're getting it into when he was stuffing, uh, when he was, stuff, when he was studying uh, Sufi mystics and um, some of the, some of the uh, magical rituals associated with like uh, dervishes and, and, and ISLAM that it's on record that people can do crazy things. You know, they can stuff, you can stuff a stiletto through their cheek without breaking their cheek. And, and Crowley himself put those down to sort of cheap conjurers tricks, obviously, but they were a part of his, part of his rituals. Um, And if there, if there is a, group or a secret organization or a secret society that Crowley was not only part of, but was a master of, if there's not one, I don't know what it is. I mean, because he was involved in everything. Um, he was um, mainly responsible for, for bringing the idea of yoga. Um, and as we'll see Buddhism to the West, especially to England. Um, and, <clears throat> and I think that it's important to understand that that's, that, that, ha- that, that, that happened. That's true. Um, he also, um, what were some other things we're going to talk about his, uh, mountaineering career. He was a serious mountaineer. Um, he was a, a capable climber and he's discussed in multiple primary sources from the day from legitimate sources, um, talking about his, his climbing. I mean, he was one of the first, uh, especially one of the first Englishmen, one of the first Westerners to climb Chogo Ri, which is K2. Um, of course he had that disaster on the slopes. Um, for which he was dubbed the wickedest man in the world. And again, I think that there is some truth. There's a, there is truth to that. Um, it's not just a sensationalized, you know, tabloid headline. Oh, this guy's bad. And we'll see that the book will oftentimes attempt to, you know, find a middle ground balanced way of looking at him. And we'll discuss like, oh, when he talks about certain of the really dark things that we know about Crowley. Oh, they're a metaphor. I don't think that they're a metaphor. I think that they're true. Um, and I think that part of the tabloidism obviously was fostered by his image and uh, Somerset mom and, you know, writer, various writers described him as a charlatan and as a fake, but in the same breath, they'll talk about the fact that he was a magnetic personality and they do believe that he did a lot of these things. I mean, mom has this quote where he talks about how Crowley, He said Crowley was a charlatan. Um, He was a fake and he was a liar. Um, But at the same time, the the weirdest part was that many of his stories were true. Now, of course they were true. Um, And of course, at the same time, he was a liar. You know, he's, he's an occult magician. He's a sorcerer. And we'll, we'll also talk about Crowley and his Satanism. Um, People will argue about whether Crowley was a Satanist or not. I think it's a moot point. Um, I think that, I think that, the distinction where we, you know, people discuss, oh, he wasn't really a Satanist. He was a Gnostic. Well, he was a Satanist, right? Um, and by his own admission, you know, Satan was, you know, he, he rejected Christianity and saw in Satan this sort of Miltonian Byronic hero, right? Um, and of course, there are reasons for that. That's down to his childhood and things that he went through, I think, and that are never discussed. I think he was put through various things, but that doesn't excuse it. And his whole thing, remember, is Thelema, the true will. And so he has free will to make these decisions and to do the things that he did. So I think that only justifies our opinion of him. Um, So uh, let's get into it, you guys. Um, Now that I'm sort of done blabbering on um, as an introduction, um, again, one more time, um, this is uh, the book, uh, Do What Thou Wilt, The Life of Aleister Crowley. I got this book in, um, uh, where was I? Uh, I think I got it while I was living in England. Um, and I first read this book in 2004. I've been reading about Crowley just as probably a lot of us have. I mean, if you're into, you know, conspiracy, uh, the world, 
um, or any of these things, Crowley is one of the cornerstones, right? I mean, you, you, you learn about it from a, if you're in, if you find out about these things from a young age, you learn about it from a young age. I first read about Crowley, I guess, probably when I was 11 or 12, because I learned about him because of reading about Led Zeppelin, right? I remember you guys remember I, I, you may, it's not important, but I talked about, you know, how I had uh, a teacher who gave me two books to read. Um, he said, these will change your life, man. And, uh, and one was no one here gets out alive uh, by, about Jim Morrison, the doors. And the other one was hammer the gods about Led Zeppelin. I, Cause I wasn't really into music still am. And that was in um, seventh grade. So that's when I first started reading about Crowley and ever since I've been reading about him. Um, and so I think that um, this will be, you know, pretty fascinating. Um, but again, we're going to learn, um, not, not learn. We're going to, we're going to find out, um, be exposed to refresh um, some things about Crowley. If you're, if you do learn from this, that's cool. I mean, that's, I'm not here to, um, again, I'm not here to like teach anybody or whatever. Um, I'm just here to go over some source material, give me my take on it and talk about um, worldviews and meaning in literature. Um, yeah. Imagine having a teacher who was based like my teacher. Uh, shouts out to Mr. Bruner. He was one of the, one of the best people I've ever seen. Just amazing teacher. Um, and um, he was, uh, he wrote, I recently read a piece um, from him. Um, this is unrelated, but he, um, my seventh grade English teacher, his, babysitter um when he was young was the author tom wolf uh, because the wolves lived across the street um because wolf is from where i'm from and um and in seventh grade we read uh the right stuff by tom wolf i later read uh the electrical acid test and um and um the mau mau book and the flat catchers and all that um but well you know tom wolf new journalism bonfire the vanities all that but yeah, if you haven't read the right stuff, it's a great book. I mean, I think it's it's a subjective book. It's a novel. It's about the you know the, the space race and all that stuff. But it's known. Be, it's a good book because it's got those those parts about Chuck Yeager and breaking the sound barrier and the X one and all that stuff. And that's that's cool to read about, especially when you're a teenager. That's cool to read about. I think that a lot of it is again propaganda and not even not even Tom Wolfe's fault. Um, I think that's just the story that you know that he got in it, but that's a whole other thing. Um, but yes, he, I recently read a piece about that and he, he himself, my teacher was a short story writer. Another book that he got, uh, that he exposed us to and, um, was this book called, uh, the pugilist at rest, um, which is a great book of short stories. And it, uh, it's about Nam and all kinds of stuff. He was an amazing, amazing, the kind of guy that you, you know, when you're, when you're a young dude, like that, like is, gives you based material and like that you continue to think about the rest of your life. So shouts out to him. Um, okay. So let's get started here. This is a, my, it's a paperback, but it's my first edition paperback of this book. Um, and let's see. Um, so here are a couple, I'm just going to start with um, the introduction here and talk about Thelema. Um, this says, uh, let's see. One disciple of the beast this is page two of the book. One disciple of the beast. Um, the beast is what, of course, um, Crowley identified himself with. He called himself the beast 666 from the beast of Revelation. His mother actually gave him that appellation. And before we keep going, yeah, shouts out to everybody who's here. Thank you so much for being here. I appreciate you all here on our Friday night. Is this a Friday night? What day is this? Is this a weekday? Um, and um, thank you to everybody. Um, please make sure you smash that like for me. Um, leave comments for me after the video's over. Get involved in the chat here, you guys. We got the most base people in the chat. All my wonderful mods and all my friends who are here. Shouts out to all my homies. Shouts out especially to Jerry at Exposing Powerful Lies. The Iceman. The Iceman. The Iceman who's out there um, slinging that ice. Literally, it's ice. It's frozen water. Um Hard working fella. Uh, shouts out to Jethro, my homeboy out there, always holding it down. Shouts out to everybody here. Jason, Steven, David. Shouts out to um, Kim, Ellie, Rachel Wilson at uh, Based Homeschool Mom, who has got such amazing work 
uh, in progress. I can't, I'm not going to say because it's her thing. I'm not going to listen. It's really, it's wonderful. It's something special. I'm not going to um, spoil anything, but I will just say that she is um, so smart. She's such a good researcher. She's working on some stuff that when it comes out, you guys, it's going to be really amazing. I'm really excited about it. She's been talking also. Somebody's helping her with her material. I'm not going to say who that is. It's not my business to say, but um, y'all are going to be really impressed. Um, so shouts out to Rachel. Shouts out also, of course, to uh, BPF um, and the Crucible. Uh, Jerry and I will be on the Crucible soon. Um Next week, I'm um, talking about MK Ultra, etc. Shouts out to um, DPH. Shouts out to our homeboy, David Patrick Carey, um, Church of the Eternal Logos. Um, I'll be on with him next week um, analyzing a film. And you guys, I'm not going to say any more, but you, it's going to be great. It's, it's really going to be fun. So shouts out to our homeboy, DPH. Um, also, big shouts out. We got a lot going on today. Shouts out to, um, of course, JD, uh, our boy, Jay Dyer at... Um, Jay's analysis, and um, of course, our homeboy Tristan at Primal Edge Health. Um, you guys, if you're not, if you don't, um, if you don't go to Tristan Haggard at um, Primal Edge Health on Instagram, you got to follow him. Um, he recently did some AMAs that are cool, and he and Mark Hacker will be on Jay tonight discussing uh, Dostoevsky. And I'm particularly excited about this, you guys, um, because. If you are uh, an old school um, Jay's analysis chat nerd, like a lot of us are, then you will know well Mark Hackard and his work um, at souloftheeast.org. And um, I cannot wait because we haven't seen him in quite, in, you know, in a little bit now. So uh, it's going to be cool. He's um, he's a, he's an amazing dude um, and uh, translates Russian, Russian uh, documents, literature, et cetera. And I think that's going to be really cool. So you guys, uh, you know, of course, I'll see you tonight over at uh, Jay Stream with um, uh, watching Jay and Hackard and um, and and beautiful Tristana talking about Dostoevsky. Okay, so sorry for that. And 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 one more thing, thank you for everybody who supported me. Of course, please, you guys. Um, you know, we're getting into summer here, and. Of course, I can always use your support. So please, you know, if you got some extra time, a few extra uh, bucks, a few extra coin in your pocket, please um, look at the links that my awesome mods have been dropping the whole time and in the video description. Um, and you can drop me a super chat. And I would I definitely really appreciate it, you guys. Of course, it's hard. It's uh, so much easier to spend money than to make money. We all know that. And so I really appreciate your generosity. And I thank you for that. So if you got a second, do that. Um, thank you. I really appreciate y'all. All right. So uh, this says on page two here, small wonder that the evils of Satanism are laid at his feet. As one disciple of the beast is observed, there's no sense in trying to whitewash Crowley's reputation. Alistair spent most of his life systematically blackening it. Clearly this Crowley fellow was an egregious sort, a shameless scoffer at Christian virtue, a spoiled scion, of a wealthy Victorian family who embodied many of the worst John Bull racial and social prejudices of his upper class contemporaries, a blisteringly arrogant opportunist who took financial and psychological advantage of his admirers, an unadmiring and even vicious judge of most of his contemporaries, a sensualist who relished sex in all forms, a hubristic experimenter in drugs who was addicted to heroin and cocaine for the last 25 years of his life. No question that the sheer egotistical bombast of the man could be stupefying for the beast regarded himself as no less than the prophet of a new aeon that would supplant the Christian era and bring on the reign of the crown and conquering child embodiment of a guiltless liberated humanity. There we go. Thank you. Somebody of a guiltless humanity that had at last chosen to become the gods. It had merely worshiped in the past. We've seen this over and over, right? This is what so much of the material we read about, you know, especially about the occult, deals with, right? Um, I mean, how much has Jerry covered this on his own stream, right? Over Exposing Powerful Lies, right? Shouts out to Kristen, my homegirl. Thank you so much for that donation at Slow Boy. Y'all go to Slow Boy Whiteboard. Endless based material, you guys. So good. What, a, I mean, she rules, you guys. She, she like, she, she is legit. 
So thank you so much. Yo, Stephen, shouts out to Stephen for that donation. I really appreciate you, homeboy. Thank you so much. All right. So um, this says, uh, let's see, this talks about his uh, reviling Christianity. Um, it's interesting because, because of course, Crowley, um, we, we know Crowley reviled uh, Christianity, but at the same time, it's interesting how much of his language um, is in the Christian paradigm, of course, because he's a, you know, he's a Gnostic and um, he is a, you know, a, a, a religious Satanist before, you know, the Temple of Satis. I mean, they can't, you know, that that's based on his work and, and his rituals. Um, but it's it's interesting to remember, um, you know, what, what his paradigm is. Um, and we'll see that as we go forth. Uh, this says... Um, Philema, um, do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law, which is it's uh, Philema's creed. Um, Crowley makes for a grippingly vile Gothic protagonist. He has been a popular model, uh, this is page three of the book, for fiction writers in search of villains and the requisite chill. Uh, chill. Somerset Mom, of course, devoted a novel, The Magician, 1906, to Crowley's uh, benev- uh, malevolent charms. Other fiction writers who have made... Um, who have modeled villains on the beast include James Branch Cabell. My cousin is the president of the James Branch Cabell. He's on the board of the James Branch Cabell um, Society um, because he's uh, from from VA. Shouts out to VA. Um, um, Let's see. Christopher Isherwood, Anthony Powell, Dennis Wheatley, of course, that Jay's covered. Um, The Devil Rides Out. Colin Wilson, Robert Anton Wilson. The The British playwright Snoo Wilson, scored a London stage hit in the 1970s with his play, The Beast. Crowley's exotic appeal has not been limited to literature since his appearance on the cover of the Beatles album, Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band, 1967. A photo of Crowley with shaven head and piercing eyes, his most enduring uh, iconographic image. The Beast has endured in the world of rock music in various guises, influencing the lyrics of the Rolling Stones, Zeppelin, David Bowie, Daryl Hall, Sting, Ozzy Osbourne, The Clash, The Cure, and then nameless, you know, unnumbered uh, rappers, right? Absol, Kanye, et cetera. Um, uh, it would seem that Crowley, uh, Jay-Z, is, a, is as irresistible a fantasy for the counterculture, which typically casts him as a defiant rebel who stood for individual freedom first and foremost. This despite Crowley's lifelong aristocratic and even at times fascistic bent in politics, he is for Christian fundamentalists who have paradoxically succeeded in perpetuating Crowley's fame by casting him as the evil exemplar best suited to sustain the healthy fear of the devil and the faithful. Okay. All right, dude. Right. It's like, no, they're just telling the truth, right? They, we are just telling the truth. Um, let's see. Um, okay. Let me skip to, uh, page six here, because this is about Blavatsky. Um, says, if, if, okay, if um, if Crowley's to be, they mentioned Faust. Of course, we did uh, Christopher Marlowe, Kit Marlowe, Faust uh, interpretation, right? Um, uh, analysis, rather. Um, if Crowley's to be misunderstood, it is it is essential also to understand, at least in basic terms, Um, the history of magical thought and practice in the West. In so doing, one must bear in mind the dilemma posed by Isaac Mesheva Singer with regard to the occult tradition that, quote, we are living in an era of amnesia. We have forgotten those vital truths that man once knew and whose strengths he lived. Um, Crowley recognized the dilemma full well. The era of amnesia had induced not merely forgetfulness, but also outright contempt for the tradition he revered and equated with the highest forms of mysticism. Well, I mean, not necessarily true. I mean, uh, occultism was at its height in the Victorian era, right into the Edwardian era. And that became partly because of Crowley. I mean, he was the, he was the evangelist of the occult, right? But even prior to that, leading up to it, we all know that the Victorian era was rife with, you know, the seance and, the, and, and it had been that way since, I mean, that was sort of a climax, but until now, of course. Um, but but we've talked about demonology. We've talked about the uh, Malleus Maleficarum, um, you know, in the in the Jacobean era. We've talked about, you know, there's sort of a rise and fall, I think, in terms of interest in the occult in wider society. Obviously, we're at a peak now. 
Um, but we've talked about this and well, and also the, uh, the Malleus book, you know, I, I, I also believe that that's, um, uh, you know, is a, well, no, the, the Malleus book is a, a book, um, from the Inquisition, but, uh, what's the other one? The, the, is it the Goetia or the Abra Melon, um, which claims to be a, a book composed by King Solomon. It, it's, a, I'm sure it's a, forgery it's a probably a victorian era forgery right however that doesn't that doesn't negate its significance in terms of the history of the occult and it, and it's all the stuff that we see now right um and also you know forgery is the whole essence of this stuff right isn't forgery the entire essence right i mean satan doesn't Satan accuses lies and mocks and mimics, not create, right? So it makes sense that forgery is rife within the, the what do you call it? The occult community, I guess. <laughs> I don't know. Um, which would be pretty much the whole world now, right? Uh, Crowley recognized the, let's see, um, the dilemma for, well, uh, let's see, uh, magic and theory and practice, 1930. Crowley explained that his own term magic with a K yes, was to be distinguished from magic with a C that had attracted dilettanti and eccentrics who sought an escape from reality. Now that's probably true. Crowley quite honorably confessed. I might quote, I myself was first consciously drawn to the subject in this way, but this early infatuation with the sheer mystery of the occult was soon supplanted by something far stronger as Crowley understood through the use of a typographical emphasis akin in its effect to concrete poetry that transforms the plain prose page into a kind of magical invocation. In other words, he's spelling, he's making spells, right? He says, uh, let me explain in a few words how it came about that I blazoned the word magic, the K in bold and capital letters, it's from Crowley, under the banner that I've borne, all, uh, I've borne before me all my life. Before I touched my teens, I was already aware that I was the beast whose number is 666. I did not understand in the least what that implied. It was a passionately ecstatic sense of identity. And my third year at Cambridge, which was uh, 1897, 1898, I devoted myself consciously to the great work, the quote, you know, the capital great work, the working, um, understanding thereby the work of becoming a spiritual being free from the constraints, accidents, and deceptions of material existence. I found myself at a loss uh, to designate my work, just as H.P. Blavatsky, there's your Blavatsky, the founder in 1875 of the Theosophical Society. Some years later, theosophy, spiritualism, occultism, mysticism, all involved undesirable connotations. I chose, therefore, the name magic and essentially, as essentially the most sublime and actually the most discredited of all the available terms, I swore to rehabilitate magic, to identify it with my own career and to compel mankind to respect, love, and trust that which they scorned, hated, and feared, I've kept my word. But by the time, but the time has now come for me to carry my banner into the thick of the press of human life. I must make magic the essential factor in the life of all. A sort of a young life thesis statement by Aleister Crowley himself. Um, and the book will get much more into uh, into um, uh, Blavatsky, of course. Um, let's see, um, page eight and nine talk about Hermes, um, Trismegistus. It says magical practice is guided by a conviction as to the fundamental unity of macrocosm and microcosm. The famous injunction of the hermetic emerald tablet, emerald, right? We've talked, we've talked in the last like 20 streams about the color green and its occult associations, right? Hey, shouts out to everybody out there. Cheers to you with your GMO poison drinks. Have one on me, folks. No, don't. Don't don't drink that. Uh, don't drink that stuff. You should be drinking. You should be drinking pure water, right? Water is the essence of wetness. Merman. <coughs> Merman. What's that from? Damn it, Derek. <laughs> Damn it, Derek, you've been down there for one day. I've been down there for 37 years. I'm not a professional TV and film actor, right? 
Anybody hey, know that movie? Thank you, Ellie. <laughs> nice. See you later. All right. Um, yes, the Emerald Tablet, ascribed to Hermes Trismegistus and dating from roughly the first century CE. Um, can I just say here, I hate it when in academic work, which, and this is rife now, this is the standard, BCE and CE, okay? I get it. I get I get what you're doing, okay? I get it in academia. I hate it. I, it's never worn off for me. The, it start, I don't know when it started, but I, I think it started about the time when I was in school because I remember sort of the transition period when I went into university where it was, you know, oh, now we're saying BCE and CE, right? Before the common era and the common era, instead of saying BC and AD, right? I hate that. It's never... My hatred of that, of that, those initials has never worn off. Okay. I, I will never not use before Christ and Anno Domini. I'm always going to do that. I don't care. I don't care what academia says. I don't, I just, I, I hate CE, common era. It's so annoying. It's so, it's fake and gay and it's lame. It's, it's stupid. Right. It's uh, whatever. OK, sorry. Had to go off on that one. Um, it says, in truth, certainly and without doubt, whatever is below is like that which is above. And whatever is above is like that which is below to accomplish the miracles of one thing. There you go with your um, as above, so below, which we always see we, the imagery and the symbolism is in everything now. Right. And. The unification of opposites, right? So this is it comes from Hermes Trismegistus, and of course, DPH David Patrick Harry has covered this in depth. I'm um, talking about Gnostic literature, and you know he's he's covered this ad nauseum, right? Uh, for us, thank you to DPH. Um, but just just as a refresher, we're just going back and finding the source material for that. Uh, it says. From this insight derives the metaphor of the magical mirror favored by Crowley. Mirrors, we talk about mirror symbolism continuously. The universe reflects the self and the self, the universe, an infinite chain of myriad images that the magus alone can encompass. As Crowley put it with respect to the task of the human magus, the microcosm is an exact image of the macrocosm. The great work is the raising of the whole man in perfect balance to the power of infinity. Such an aim can seem decidedly hubristic and Crowley was vain enough, often enough, uh, was vain enough, often enough, in his pursuit. But Crowley did also recognize the hubris of the swollen self and his genuine revulsion against it spurred him to singular efforts at escaping its domain. Then they go on to make a strict distinction between low and high magic or black magic and white magic, and which is bullshit. And Crowley himself um, was, you know, not a victim of this. I mean, he was exploring, you know, this is how he went on his little journey. But he... he the book will discuss how he um, saw, you know, first he drew distinctions and then he became a white magician and a black magician. Then he went on to have these salons and and in his apartments, he was living in a hotel in London and um, in his 20s. And he actually, you know, he rent out a number of rooms, of course. And <clears throat> because of what he learned from his magical alchemical training and all this, of course, he devoted two of the rooms as they were called closets. Um, to the practice of magic. One room was a was a room of white magic. He called it white magic, which had um, which had eight mirrors in it. Eight because I guess of the uh, intercursal. Well, that no, that's a hexagram. The intercursal uh, hexagram, but um, it had a, a system of eight mirrors in it. And then there was another room, which was his room for black magic, which had a a, a, a gross creeper altar. Um, and like, you know, memento mori and various stuff. So, um, we'll, we'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, but, but then my point is then he eventually went on to say, uh, white magic is not a thing. And he became, of course, and that was part of, that was another thing is sort of unification of those two opposites. If that's what he saw, yo, shouts out to, let's see, <laughs> shouts out to my homeboy out there. Yo, Let's go. Thank you, Jerry. Appreciate you, homeboy. Big $15 donation. I thank you, man. You're working hard out there. You are the ice man. 
You are so generous. And I love you, homeboy. Thank you so much. I really appreciate you, buddy. Yo. Oh, he said, oh, he sent me another one, too. Yo, you guys, come on now. Jerry's out there slanging all day, going state to state, delivering ice to all the mall warts out there, trying to keep you all cool. You know, and you're letting him surpass you. Come on now. Come on. This is a hard working man. I know we got some we got some uh whales out there. <laughs> Yeah. No, thank you so much, everybody. Appreciate you. Thank you, Jerry. Um, says, let's see. Okay. Pages 10 and 11 are about Gnosticism and the inverted sacrament. Okay. So this says, um, let's see. Uh, it talks about Simon Magus. We just talked about Simon Magus in, uh, oh, in the Inferno stream. Remember Dante sees Simon Magus in hell. Um, Page 11, it says the practice of sexual magic. Oh boy, here we go. The practice of sexual magic, which uh, forms one of the primary bases for Crowley's notoriety, uh, will be examined in greater detail. Um, it, for now, it's noted that sexuality played a persistent role in magical, mystical practices in the West in the centuries prior to Christ and has continued to do so, albeit in a surreptitious manner in the centuries since. Even now, right? Um, uh, LEAD compared Indian tantric and Shivite sexual practices with those of certain Gnostic sects. Sects. For the reader who experiences visceral disgust at the thought of sexual emissions as sacred components of worship, uh, Eliad's um, scholarly conclusion may serve as a palliative. All these systems seem to have in common the hope that the primordial spiritual unity can be reconstituted through erotic bliss and the consumption of S-E-M-E-N and the M-E-N-S-E-S. Oh. In all three systems, the, the G-E-N-I-T-A-L sequitions, oh my gosh, represent the two divine modes of being, the God and the goddess. Consequently, their ritual consumption augments and accelerates the sanctification of the celebrants. What is described here is sexuality as sacramental ritual, sex, sex magic, right? <laughs> Red hot chili peppers, blood sugar, sex magic. Uh, with, with, I'm laughing because did, you guys, did you see? <laughs> there was a Sam Hyde recently where he and Nick were talking and, and Nick <laughs> was doing his Red Hot Chili Peppers <laughs> impression. I, I'm not even going to do it. I, I can hear it in my head, though. But if you if you find that, it's really funny. I actually like I, I love the Red Hot Chili Peppers. Or I did, you know, in the 90s. Um, but I love the Red Hot Chili Peppers. And, of course, I've talked about Anthony Kiedis' biography, Scar Tissue, which I, I love. It's a great book. But, I mean, they did name their album. as a, It's a Crowleyan album, right? But, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm laughing also because I'm trying to get away from the creeper grossness that I just read. Um, but that's true, right? Um, it says... If the reader can give no credence to sexuality in this sense, a goodly portion of life and writings of Aleister Crowley is instantaneously transformed into the worst sort of libertine shaming. Well, yeah, because it was. Right? He was the ultimate libertine. Whatever one thinks of Crowley's sexual mores, they're not mores. They're legitimately, they're, they're legitimately gross. And Crowley could be lustful and crude and at times even vicious toward his partners. Sexuality as a means to gnosis became, from the middle decades of his life, a guiding reality for him. As such, purely personal attachments could seem to as nothing to him. Personal love between sexual partners is unnecessary for the religious sexual practices cited by Eliad, part of OTO, right? Indeed, the cruelty that shows itself in too many of Crowley's relationships was clearly fostered by the impersonality that sex took on for him. But Crowley was no hypocrite and his magic was no mere ruse for obtaining sex. When sex was all Crowley wanted, he was hardly ashamed to say so. Come on, man. Stop making fucking excuses, right? Um, all right. So let's skip forward to, so, okay. So I'm going to summarize, um, some of his early life. So he was born, so Crowley was born in 1870, uh, 1875 in, uh, Limington Spa in, uh, Warwickshire, in Warwickshire. He was from Warwick, potatoes. He was from Warwickshire, um, which is, you know, Shakespearean uh, territory, right? With Stratford, um, it's also where uh, the, I think it's where the Ikes live. It's where um, uh, Gareth Ike was born. Um, just weird coincidence. But anyway, that's where Crowley was born. And um, 
you know, as most of you probably know, Crowley was born into a, a well-to-do family. Um, his dad essentially ran uh, Crowley Ales. Alistair Crowley. Crowley. I call him Crowley. I've always called him Alistair Crowley, and I'll continue to do that. Um, I know that one reason people will call him Alistair Crowley, and that's fine that people do that. That's that's fine. It doesn't matter. Fuck this guy anyway, right? Um, but one reason that people do that is because Crowley himself, in his writing, uh, in one of his poems, gives an instruction to the reader on how to pronounce his name. I forget what he rhyme, rhymes Crowley with, but it's kind of like, it always reminds me that, first of all, he's a liar. And second of all, <laughs> it reminds me of the fact that, um, if you guys ever read um, the book Don Juan, um, the, the epic poem, not, not Don Juan DeMarco with John Depp and Brando, which actually is not a bad movie. You should go back and, and I should go back and rewatch that movie. No, but Don Juan, the epic poem by Lord Byron. We've covered Lord Byron, of course, here. Um, but the scholars will often say, um, and that's fine that they do so, that it's actually pronounced Don Juan, right? Because, it, because of the rhyming couplet within the poem. But connotation, denotation and connotation are things. And no matter what, connotation becomes truth. And it doesn't become a truth that overrides the denotation. The denotation of a word is the dictionary definition, right? The connotation is the perceived meaning or the current meaning or the meaning that the word has taken on over time. Now, that's natural because of spoken language, thought, geography, climate, time. There are a number of ways that that comes into, into being. Look at look at denotation and connotation with certain symbols and flags, right? No matter what, no matter what your inclination is, right? There are certain flags where you may say, this was the flag and this is what it meant, you know, name the flag. This is what it meant uh, at the time. And that's true. That was the denotation. But the fact is that the connotation of a symbol or a flag has come to mean something else. Now that's a, in a way for a lot of things that can be unfortunate, but at the same time, it's just, that just happens. So what I'm saying is that in the, in the, you know, matrix of the popular culture or learning or whatever, we call it Don Juan. That's what it is. And, and that's fine. I say Aleister Crowley because that's what it's come to be. Now, Aleister Crowley, himself also gave an instruction on how to pronounce his name in terms of he, his, his real name is Edward Alexander Crowley. Right. And I'm kind of glossing over some of the early sections. I'm just going to do it from memory here and before I get back to the text, but um, his parents, especially his mother called him Alec. And he hated that name because he associated it with whatever it was, the brutality that he suffered when he was young. And I, I would say, I don't have any evidence for this, but I would say that he certainly, I, I would venture to guess that he certainly suffered um, some sort of psychosexual trauma, you know, at a young age, either at the hands of his mother or somebody close. Um, and that would be the reason for a lot of this, this stuff. Later on, he goes to school, he goes to boarding school. And we talked about when we did the Byron stream about a lot of the outrageous you know, demonic behavior that, that went on, especially with Byron um, and his sort of GMAX venturing into GMAX territory. Um, but I think that, I think that, um, oh, so, so, okay. So uh, he was, so he was called Alec and he makes a point because he was a writer, you know, uh, Crowley was a poet and um, even um, Chesterton, um, G.K. Chesterton uh, praised some of Crowley's poems. He said that, you know, he said he, this guy's the next big thing. And so he, he obviously had a way with words. He was a wordsmith. Um, part of his, you know, magic and his whole persona was the ability, ability to sway people using words, language. And he talks about how he hated the, the name Alec because of the cacophony in it, right? And because of the, k and he saw it as like, I think of it almost like in a, in a Tolkien, in a Tolkien way of, of, you know, how Gollum coughs his name out, right? Um, he saw it as this like cacophonous thing where um, essentially like his mother would call him the beast, 
right? He was, a, she would say he was a dirty little beast and which is horrible. And, um, and she would use that name. So later on, he transformed his name into Alistair. He took the name Alistair because he got it from um, Shelley's, uh, Shelley's poem, Alistair, which is A-L-I-S-T-O-R. But he took it uh, as the Gaelic form of the name Alexander because Crowley identified himself as being Irish. I mean, he just passed himself as himself off as being Celtic or Irish of, in his life. And, and then he talks about how um, he read that powerful names, uh, uh, you know, in history are um, uh, a spondy followed by a, a trochee. Okay. Now what that means in terms of literature is a, a spondy is a, a poetic unit of three uh, a three syllable measure in verse, right? Which would be um, stressed, stressed, unstressed. And then a trochee. What's up, TGF, my homeboy? Good to see you, buddy. Good to see you, Green Feathers. Nick, TGF, our homeboy here. Um, a trochee is the opposite of an I am. You know, when we, people talk about iambic pentameter. Well, trochaic is what the weird sisters, the witches speak at the beginning of Macbeth, right? Double, double, toil and trouble. It's uh, it's stressed, unstressed, like Crowley. So in other words, just to break it down, um, he took on that name because he thought it would be sort of magical in terms of the great, like for instance, Julius Caesar, right? Julius Caesar, um, Alistair, uh, stressed, unstressed, unstressed, and then the trochee, stressed, unstressed. I hope I... I don't know, but in, you know, if that's confusing, all it is to say is that he chose his name um, for its poetic or its its verse measurement. Um, Crispy said, I heard that the family came from County Cavan in Ireland. Kristen. Shouts out to our boy Crispy out there. Hold it down. Hold it down in the old country. I wasn't trying to do an accent there. I'm really bad at a... Um, at a Southern Irish and Republican accent, Crispy. So forgive me. I, I, I usually don't try it because I'm not very good at it. It always sounds like a, an American putting on a, an Irish accent. From County Cavan, eh? Um, my, not from County Dine? Crisp, you don't have any ancestry from uh, County Dine? Let's see. Uh, yo, shouts out to TGF. Oh, thank you, homeboy. I appreciate you. Shouts out for that awesome $10 donation. I appreciate you, homeboy. Always appreciate you. Nick out there holding it down. Thank you, sir. You are wonderful, and I appreciate you. Okay, so this says, um, okay, uh, on page 36. Uh, oh, where, where was I just now? I'm sorry, I'm, I'm jumping around a lot. There's a lot to his life. So I'm kind of, I'm trying to kind of give you specific details uh, that that I remember, you know, from the book, but that I remember um, uh, before we get to the actual citations of the book sort of later on in his youth. Um, yeah, so when he was young, <clears throat> his dad was a, um, of course, they made their fortune in Crowley Ale. Um, and that was essentially, they were brewer, they were a brewery, a brewing family and, um, they, they made beer in the Victorian era. And then they had a series of, you know, pubs and restaurants where they sold beer and sandwiches and they were, it was lucrative and they made a fortune it was Crowley's granddad who started the company. And then his dad ran the company, but his dad spent most of his time, uh, in their sect called the Plymouth Brethren. Now the Plymouth Brethren are essentially, um, an ultra Puritan, you know, they, they always describe it as an ultra Puritan fundamentalist offshoot of uh, Anglicanism. And um, they were strict. His mother, he says, his, he says his mother was essentially an atheist, but that somehow she found, she found her way of being with the Plymouth brethren. was like, was like, I, I picture her almost as like a squeaky from character. She's like, you know, extremely harsh. Um, and, she would throw away his book. Her name was, I forget her name, maybe Emily. Anytime there was a character named Emily in a book that he was reading, I think there's, is it David Copperfield? 
And he's reading David Copperfield. His mother takes the book, throws it in the fire, or throws it out. Wouldn't let him read anything. Um, and uh, anyway, so he idolized his father. His, he looked up to his dad. He saw his dad as like this monumental figure. Um, and his dad was, you know, I think probably the source material will say that his dad wasn't really a big deal in the Plymouth Brethren, but maybe locally he was. But he was magnanimous and had money. And Crowley was a, you know, as as a youngster, was a devoted Plymouth Brethren. He was all in. But then what happened was um, he saw his dad uh, die of tongue cancer. And so for him in his youth, I guess the irony is that his dad, who had this way with words, then the words were taken away and he saw him suffer. You know, he, 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 his rite of passage was, you know, he saw he watched his dad die and it, it, it shattered him. It broke him. Um, maybe in a way that he, you know, in a, maybe, maybe that was, I don't think that was the only thing that did it, but that was one of the things. And then, and then essentially he became the Crowley that we know. Um, it talks about how he was, things were done to him um, when he was young, especially by their nursemaid. And then he, he grew up a little. And then he talks about how he uh, essentially defiled their maid um, on his mother's bed and that the Freudian, you know, symbolism, could not have escaped Crowley. Obviously he knew what he, what that was. Um, but that's, you know, um, and then essentially he had ill health all throughout his youth. Uh, he had asthma, he had all these problems. He had scarlet fever and, um, and that he, uh, he was at school and it was, he was, uh, he was, you know, he was intelligent, he was high IQ. Um, he was intelligent and he wasn't challenged. Then he was sent off to a boarding school where I think um, more really terrible things were done to him. He had, it was horrible. Um, and then he, um, as a form of punishment for something he did, they essentially like locked him in this closet and he was kept there for like six months. Um, and he was, you know, he was beaten, he was starved. And eventually the family had to take him out of the, out of it because his kidneys were failing and he was going to die. So then he had to stay at home and like, you know, whatever. Then he had a, um, a, a tutor who uh, was an Anglican minister who like, Oh, sort of like was a invigorating character and gave him like books to read. It was exciting. Took him on, uh, took him on like field trips, field trips for Crowley were like, Oh, we're going to go to Scotland and go fishing. Oh, we're going to go to France. Um, and you know, you're going to learn chess. Um, then we're going to, he, he taught him how to play cards. He taught him card tricks, gambling, and essentially all of the Victorian activities of the gentleman, um, which would be, you know, the, the dudes hanging out together, which would be essentially, uh, drinking cards, probably, probably opium usage and laudanum. Um, then, uh, then he went off to Cambridge and at Cambridge, this is where we pick it up in the book on page 37. At Cambridge, um, he was involved in the Magpie and uh, Stump, which was a club. You know, they always have weird names for clubs in the old schools. Um, even at Harvard and Yale, they have those. Um, but he was a member of a, you know, a gentleman's club, which was, uh, it says, a Trinity debating. He was at Trinity College at Cambridge. Um, uh and it was a Trinity Debating Society that met weekly in the lecture rooms of the old court. The Magpie and Stump had the ambiance of a gentleman's private club. Crowley wrote in his confessions he could not take the, the club seriously. It seemed to me absurd for these young asses to emit their callow opinions on important subjects. But the weekly records disclosed that Crowley was an active member uh, with an all but perfect attendance record um, for two years. Only in his final year at Cambridge did his devotion begin to wane. As members could choose their sides on debate, the record of Crowley's stances is of some interest in determining his views as a young man. <laughs> he defended the proposition that genius is only a manifestation of insanity. <laughs> this was a commonplace theory in the 90s fostered, fostered by the then influential writings of the German thinker Max Nordau. And it was uh, one long, it was one that long continued to intrigue Crowley. He opposed the proposition that black is white, though he would soon enough come to regard the union of contradictions as this keystone to spiritual progress. We just mentioned that a second ago, right? Unification of opposites. Um, regrettably, 
There's no record of Crowley's participation on the night of February 19th, 1897, when the members of the club voted by an 11 to 8 margin in favor of the proposition that this house sympathizes, quote, this house sympathizes with Satan in his sorrows. So imagine this Cambridge de uh, debate society voting in favor of sympathizing with Satan, right? And that Crowley wasn't there. He probably was there. He just, he just wasn't on the books. Um, it says, the vote by his peers cast light on the tendency common within Crowley's generation to regard Satan as a more a romantic than an evil figure. Crowley was far from alone in his rebellion against Christian morals, though he distinguished himself in the lengths to which he would carry it. Yeah, okay. Um, let's see. Um, page 38 and 39, I wrote that Crowley pines for Christ. If only he pursued his faith and not veered into the military order of the temple with creeper gay experiences. Um, so it says... Let's see. Um, he's admitted into a secret society. Um, uh, he went to Stockholm um, and he wrote and he woke. He, he it says he woke up. He writes, I awakened the knowledge that I possessed a magical means of becoming conscious of and satisfying a part of my nature, which had up to that moment concealed itself from me. It was an experience of horror and pain combined with a certain ghostly terror yet at the exact same time, it was the key to the purest and holiest spiritual ecstasy that exists. Um, and I think part of this was his activity um, with, uh, with a, a sexual activity that he was involved in. Um, on page 39, then came the great, uh, says something about his psyche, and then came the great awakening. Um Curious to say, this is Crowley's writing, curious to say it was toward the hour of midnight on the last day of the year when the old slinks away from the new that he happened to be riding alone, wrapped in the dark cloak of unutterable thoughts. He's talking about himself in the third person. Freedom had he sought, but not the freedom that he had gained. Blood seemed to ooze from his eyelids and trickle down drop by drop upon the white snow, riding on its surface, pure surface, the name of Christ. Great bats flitted by him and vultures whose bald heads were clotted with rotten blood. Ah, the world, the world, the failure of the world. And then an amber light surged around him. The fearful tapestry of torturing thought was rent asunder. The voices of many angels sang to him, Master, Master, I found thee, O silver Christ. He says, then all was nothingness, nothing, nothing, nothing. And madly his horse carried him into the night. Thus he set out on his mystic quest toward that goal which he had seen and which seemed so near. And yet, as we shall learn, proved to be so far away. So I think that um, it goes on to talk about the philosopher's stone and how the philosopher's stone is essentially a, the philosopher's stone essentially deals with uh, sexual, sexual, magical practice and imagery um, and how he um, sort of veered away from pure alchemy into, um, into Kabbalah. Now we see those, we see those things as having a lot to do with each other, but it says, um, uh, page 40 and for Crowley released from the thrall of Christian dualism and sin was an obsession par excellence. Um, small wonder that his first stumbling steps toward magical practice involved a fascination with heresy. He wrote the forces of good were those which had constantly oppressed me. I saw them daily destroying the happiness of my fellow men. Since therefore it was my business to explore the spiritual world, my first step must be to get in personal communication with the devil. What a dumbass, right? Um, he wrote a prologue to his first book of verse, which was uh, Akadama, which is the this is pure blasphemy, right? It's the name of the field um, that Judas bought and uh, on which he was hanged uh, with his silk, with his uh, thirty pieces of silver. Um, then he goes on, he goes on to talk about um, page 41. The death struggle may have been with self, but Crowley staged the struggle in terms of the dramatic dichotomy. Oh, okay. I need to read this part. Um, the, he says, I was in the death struggle with self. God and Satan fought for my soul those three long hours. God conquered. Now I have only one doubt left. Which of the twain was God? So that's essentially... 
it's essentially, um, yeah, it's essentially um, him saying that he came to like some sort of Gnostic realization, right? <laughs> right. Um, and it says, the death struggle may have been with self, but Crowley staged the struggle in terms of the dr dramatic dichotomy of God and Satan. Given such protagonists, the pe potentially pivotal role of cer ceremonial magic was obvious. Um, a chance recommendation by a Cambridge bookseller led Crowley to a collection of medieval grimoire extracts edited with extensive commentary by A.E. Waite and luridly titled The Book of Black Magic and Pacts from 1898. Now, A.E. Waite, you, you'll remember A.E. Waite was the guy who designed the most famous, um, what when you think of tarot cards, right, that's the Rider Waite pack. So it's interesting how, um, and Crowley, I think Crowley came to know A.E. Waite, but um, it's interesting how many of these are like chance encounters that lead him on to something else. Uh, I mean, for instance, his initiation in the gold in the, into the Golden Dawn, um, even his first encounter with Golden Dawn came because he was, um, I think he was in Switzerland and he was talking to uh, some, some other mountaineers and he was talking about like esoteric tradition and esotericism and magical ritual. And he happened to be talking to this other mountaineer who was like an expert in it. And then, the, and then, that guy, the next morning he got up and he was going to go talk to the guy. He was going to go find him and talk to him because he thought about it all night. And then the guy said that the guy was already like started hiking like three hours earlier. And Crowley ran like 10 miles to go find this guy. And and then he found him. And then the guy was like, yeah, he was like, Crowley essentially said, like, teach me everything. And then the guy said, um, well, if you want to know about this, then when you get back to Cambridge, like, call this number essentially. And then that was the number that introduced him to the golden dawn. Does that make sense? Um, it says, um, uh, it says, let's see. It talks about AE weight. Um, okay. On page 44, um, on page 44, he gets syphilis. <laughs> Um, he, he already had a number of those types of things because of his activities, you know, his, his activities with the old boys, uh, going to the various, um, houses of prostitution. He got the clap and all this stuff. Um, and then he ended up getting syphilis. Um, and I saw in the, where was that in the comments somewhere, maybe it was in, in uh, Rachel shouts out to Rachel in her Twitter. Um, uh, somebody had said, you know, it was Crowley or the story of his syphilitic life or the long-term effects of, effect of syphilis of, of syphilis. And that's probably, that's probably true. Um, but that doesn't mean it's the only thing. That's not all that influenced him. Crispy said, who hasn't gotten it by page 44? <laughs> yeah. <he's, laughs> it says, uh, let's see. Um, he, uh, Crowley was an entree into the decadent world, uh, the decadent, capital D, decadent world. He took advantage of it. Amongst the personages he met uh, was the decadent artist par excellence, Aubrey Beardsley, um, who was to die later that year. Um, it says, this says, um, Uh, 1898 became a watershed for Crow, uh, Crowley's poetic ambitions. Um, he uh, had a publisher. And, oh, and then it talks about how, this is weird, but um, Crowley wrote essays um, essentially condemning Oscar Wilde. Remember the trial of Oscar Wilde, remember, uh, Rhett, Ballard and Redding Gale. Oscar Wilde was sent off to Redding Gale on um, his accusations of being, you know, was, uh, and he was convicted of being a sodomite, right? And, um, and it's interesting that Crowley at the time, especially, uh, wrote essays condemning Wilde for his, for his, uh, sodomite behavior and decadence. Um, <laughs> even though when you look at photographs of Crowley from the time, it's, it's weird because, you know, the, when you see those photographs of, um, Oscar Wilde, you know, the, the, the dandy Oscar Wilde, you know, those are only from a single photographic session. And he got him um, when he came to America, Oscar Wilde took a tour of America, a reading tour, essentially, you know, he was a superstar, but, and he had his, he had his photograph taken. Um, 
but that was one session, right? It's kind of like when you look at the photograph of Poe, there's like a couple of photographs of Poe. And um, that was from one, you know, people back then had like one photo, right? Remember the Norm McDonald joke about photos? Um, and, uh, and Crowley though was living at the time, you know, this is like 1898 or so. And he's in like, he's got like tons of photos, right? Of course now he lived from 1875 to 1947. So that was getting into the photographic age, but, but even his young photos, I mean, he's clearly like a foppish dandy, right? Um, and in the style of Oscar Wilde, and he was doing things that Oscar Wilde was doing and much worse. And yet he condemns him in these essays, which is very strange, but I think speaks probably to his, maybe to his changing state of mind or his, you know, what he felt as a member of the establishment, but also the fact that he was just a liar at times and, um, and certainly w was a gaslighter. Um, one of the jokes, one of the, one of the things I thought was funny in the book was there was a time when, uh, when he moved to Bolskin house um, on the shores of Loch Ness, right. By the way, Bolskin house is burned down. I remember it burned down a few years ago. Um, Jimmy Page had bought it and then it was sold on. But anyway, it burned. Um, and uh, it talks about how Crowley, when he moved there, he wrote, <laughs> this is funny. He wrote a letter to the like local, um, the, uh, what do you call it? The, you know, Society of Morals or whatever it was in the Victorian era at the time. And, uh, and he wrote to him and they were actually influential and they, they sent, and he said, he wrote a letter saying, um, saying, uh, I'm concerned with the prostitution in this, in this village. Um, you know, it, it's rampant and, uh, you know, you need to send somebody up here to sort this out. So they sent, uh, like a lawyer from London all the way up to Scotland, to the Highlands in Scotland, um, to, uh, to check out the, the depravity and the decadence of the town. And then they wrote to him and they said, um, they said, what are you talking about? We haven't found anything here. And he said, he said, uh, yes, my letter was about the, uh, the notable prostitution in the town, notable in its absence. <laughs> Such a dick. Right? He, you imagine like Victorian Edwardian era. They're like, Crowley's like got nothing going on. He's sitting up at the Bolskin house, taking drugs and doing weird rituals. And he's got the time to write strongly worded letters to, to like newspapers and societies that will take weeks to get there for a joke that will take like a couple of weeks. I think that's, I thought that was funny. Um, I don't obviously don't agree with it, but I think it's funny. Um, okay. So let's see. It talks about um, page 48. I mean, he was just such a, He's just such a creep, right? Uh, page 48. If Crowley had no practical career in mind, he nonetheless was fired by at least one worldly aspiration. Fame, above all, was the laurel he wished for. So intent was Crowley that in pursuit, in its pursuit, he had chosen a new name for himself while at Cambridge. Um, a book he had read suggested that the ideal measure for a famous name was a dactyl followed by a trochee. Did I say dactyl earlier or spondy? I think I said spondy. Forgive me. It's a dactyl. A dactyl is stressed, unstressed, unstressed. A uh, spondy is, what's a spondy? Um, unstressed, 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 stressed. Um, followed by a trochee. Again, that's stressed, unstressed in terms of the, I know I'm getting into kind of the uh, spurgish aspects of verse here. Um, says, and so Crowley chose Alistair a variant Gaelic form of his middle name, Alexander, and an homage to the, and an, and an homage, folks, in the parlance of our times, to the contemplative hero of Shelley's poem, Alistair, or the spirit uh, of the spirit of solitude, Shelley, Percy Shelley. We've discussed Shelley here. Remember, go back to my Shelley stream on Ozymandias. Alistair Crowley was thus born, a name Crowley describing. Also, Alistair Crowley makes sense in the sense that it it rhymes it it's um it's a it's a true rhyme in terms of assonance right the ah sounds right or the owl sounds alistair crowley right it rhymes um in terms of its assonance um this says um 
Alistair Crowley was thus born a uh, name Crowley describing, uh, described tellingly in the confessions as a nom de guerre. Not a nom de plume, a nom de guerre, right? He added sanguinely that I can't say that I feel sure that I facilitated the process of becoming famous. I should doubtless have done so, whatever name I had chosen. <laughs> okay. Um, in three spheres, next chapter, in three spheres, poetry, mountain climbing, and spiritual truth, uh, Crowley yearned for ultimate achievement while possessing but a callow understanding of the world outside the manicured lawns of Trinity. Um, and he did ach achieve those. Um, four years later, let's see, he met a guy named uh, Gerald Kelly. Ger Gerald Kelly will play a major role in Crowley's life um, and became one of his, Kelly became, um, later on it says on page 50, Kelly would go on to enjoy a career as, he was sort of one of Crowley's cohorts. Um, Crowley had a series of, Scarlet women, you know, we'll get into Rose and Lola Zaza and all, all these people. Lola Zaza, Zaza was his uh, daughter's name, but uh, Rose and what's the other one's name? Um, anyway, a series of Scarlet women that essentially is after what we're covering because that's after the book of the law. But he also had a series of, he also had a series of um, essentially apprentices, one of whom was. Yeah, it does sound like a nice place for a picnic. The, the, the verdant fields of Trinity College, right? Um, but he had a series of apprentices, uh, one of whom we've covered was Victor Neuberg, um, who Victor, Victor Neuberg wrote the in, uh, introduction and, and published, he was responsible for publishing uh, Dylan Thomas. We've covered Dylan Thomas here, of course. Um, but uh, yeah, he had a series of those and essentially everybody that he came across um, was destroyed, right? Uh, we broke their minds, but but Gerald Kelly was one who kind of escaped. By the time of his death in 1972, he was Sir Gerald Kelly, the one-time president of the August British Royal Academy. His youthful friendship with the notorious Aleister Crowley had become, in retrospect, an embarrassment, but it was a vital friendship in its time, fostered by shared artistic ambitions and a certain formative parallels in the background. They were both into magic. Um, and then, um, let's see, uh, Alistair Crowley um, was, he uh, one of the guys he idolized was Sir Richard Burton, not Richard Burton, the, the famous actor, two-time husband of Elizabeth Taylor, Richard Burton, but Sir Richard Burton. Sir Richard Burton was famous because he um, was an explorer and he, uh, he like, was one of the first Englishmen to... Uh, penetrate the wilderness and the wilds of sub-Saharan Africa and the Middle East. He also was one of the first Englishmen to, I don't know what the word is, infiltrate the Hajj. He witnessed the Hajj. Um, uh, he was in disguise. Actually, I've got his, let me get his book real quick. I've got his book over here. Um, uh, yes. Uh, Sir Richard Burton, um, the Pale Abyssinian, that's his book right there. Uh, Life and Times of Sir Richard Burton. And he was a, I don't know if Crowley knew him, but um, but he was an influence on Crowley because of his adventures. I, I, I got, you know, I, I like reading about Richard Burton. I read about Richard Burton, the explorer, Sir Richard Burton. Um, for, uh oh, oh no, you guys did. I'm sorry, Ellie. I'm sorry, you guys. I'm, I do apologize. I was trying to stand up to get my book, and um, and I apologize, you guys. <sighs> Seeing my boxers, okay. I'm. I really am sorry about that. That's uh, that's embarrassing. Um, but uh, I I first read about Richard Burton, and I read his book. Let's see, I read it in April 2001. I read it because. I was uh, reading about Rambo and his travels um, into uh, Aden and um, and Abyssinia because Rambo became, of course, a gun runner in in Africa, and uh, one of the people sort of parallel with him was Richard Burton. So anyway, um, then it talks about how uh, uh, Crowley went off to Mexico to uh, practice mountaineering 
for Chogo Ri. Chogo Ri, of course, is K2. <clears throat> now, I'm not an expert in mountaineering, um, but I do know that uh, K2 and, you know, obviously Everest is the highest peak, but I know that climbers um, find K2 to be the most difficult mountain to climb because not only is it, you know, a Himalayan mountain and it's the second highest peak, but because there are villages and towns like surrounding Everest. So it's, it's, it's easier to get there. K2 is isolated. Like the nearest town is like 10 miles away and it's over, you know, massive Himalayan peaks. So just to get there is something that most people can't even do. So they have to get there. And then the climb itself is much more difficult. Um, so Crowley was intent on climbing K2 and I don't think he was the first to scale it, but he was one of the first. And, um, and to practice for this, he went off to Mexico and he, practiced on like volcanic peaks. And at times they talk about how they couldn't even climb because they were on, they were literally on active volcanoes and their hands and feet were getting singed. Now this is the early 20th century, right? And you imagine, imagine this guy, like he, he's got so much money and, you know, he is pure establishment, right? He is, he has so much money. He goes to the best schools. He goes to Cambridge. He wants to be a poet. He pub he self publishes his poetry. Nothing wrong with self publishing your poetry. I mean, even now, I mean, a lot of the great poets will self publish their their poems. Rambo did that in France. Um, that's that's probably what I need to do um, because who you know what what's the publishing company, right? who runs the publishing company and who's going to, who's going to buy your book of poems. Right. So anyway, whatever. So he did that. And, um, and then he gets into mountaineering. So he goes in all over the world, you know, on these, ask, on these, on these adventures, like just practicing. Right. Um, and let's see. Um, he, um, Let's see. Oh, then he gets into the Golden Dawn on page 53. Um, he meets uh, this guy named McGregor Matthews. And uh, McGregor Matthews is his main sort of antagonist. Um, but he gets introduced into the Golden Dawn and become, he gets initiated and he rises through the grades. The, the Golden Dawn, the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn is this um, early 20th century secret society, I like, you know, sort of a skull and bones as society at Cambridge, which had, you know, a few members. Um, but it was a literal, uh, magical society. And they had sort of three, there were three levels to the golden dawn. Crowley will later on talk about how the first and second circle, they're, they're called circles. The first and second circles of the golden dawn are essentially for the initiate into the occult. And the third circle of the Golden Dawn is one that nobody, nobody can make it through the grades. Uh, I think McGregor Matthews is the one who authored the initiation process into the grades, but nobody can do it, whatever the rituals are. And Crowley himself later essentially did the grades or claimed he did the grades. But then he will later say that the third grade or circle of the Golden Dawn is essentially, you know, a trend transcending into the illumination of the great white brotherhood or the ascended masters of Blavatsky. Um, and McGregor Matthews claims that he gets his instruction for how to write the, the initiation from the, from the uh, ascended masters. And, um, and Crowley like will have this battle with him because he can't understand why he isn't initiated. So his, a lot of his later search is like to get in touch with the, with the, the, the so-called ascended masters who he, whom he describes as preternatural beings. Um, and, and um, these far from believing that these are, uh, that this is made up or fake um, or that these are aliens. I think they're alien. Uh, aliens are faking. Hey, go, Hey, um, obviously, but if there are aliens, you know, these are demons. Um, these are demons people. No, but he, um, Yes, Natsuki, exactly. The the ascended masters are preternatural or 
you know, interdimensional beings. They're demons. Um, and that was his search. He went through these rituals to get in touch and to receive instruction from these demon beings. And that was the whole point of his thing. Um, yeah, uh, Kristen says Land gave him <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, yes. Um, well that and, and Lamb was his, you know, first he contacted Iwas, which was the name of this demon. And um I I do think that that happened. Um that's how he received his instruction. And the rituals are so dark and so deep. I think that I mean this is this is like the biblical black magic, right? This is this is like the sorcerer. Um, and he's doing these things. His whole point was. Crowley's whole point was that he thought that not only that he could become a God, right? That man will become God of the new uh, Aeon, you know, the crown and conquering child, but also that he could steal his way into heaven through, through Gnosticism and through black magic. Right now, of course that's demonic, right? Um, and He's opening himself up to uh, demons, but this is the sort of start um, with the Golden Dawn. Um, this is the real start. And one of the first things he learns at Golden Dawn is uh, astral projection. Um, and on page 56, we get um, Blavatsky. It says, um, the, uh, it talks about um, self-styled Rosicrucian groups, the the inspiration for much of the magic in Paris was Eliphas Levi, the nom de plume of Alphonse Louis Constant, a one-time candidate for the Catholic priesthood who, after a struggle of conscience, found truths better suited to his taste in the hermetic tradition. Um, Levi died in May 1875, some four months before Crowley was born. Crowley would nonetheless later claim Levi as one of his previous incarnations, Levi's soul having passed into the fetus Crowley in utero. The London success... The London success of the Theosophical Society sprang full-blown from the inventions of its principal founder, the famed and flamboyant Helena Petrovna Blavatsky, a Russian-born self-proclaimed medium and seer. Self-proclaimed, but, you know, I think she was a medium and a seer. Um, in her massive works, Isis unveiled, she was also a charlatan, just like Crowley was, but that's part of it, right? Isis unveiled and the Secret Doctrine, 1888. Of course, we've, we know all about the Secret Doctrine. Um, 1888, the year of the year of Jack the Ripper saying one day people will look back and say, I gave birth to the 20th century. Blavatsky offered an imaginative and, and oh, imaginative and rhetorically powerful syncretist blending of Western esotericism and Eastern mysticism and attempted as well to heal the rift between science and religion in the West by pointing to their common ultimate aims. Okay, here we go. Uh, Blavatsky specified as the source of the wisdom offered in her writings perfected Mahatmas who dwelled in Tibet and were called upon to watch over the evolution of humankind and lead it into a new age of universal, of so-called universal brotherhood. Now the universal brotherhood is what we hear old Frank talking about in Rome, right? And I think that there's a lot to be said for the fact that the so-called ascended masters live in Tibet and that later on the, there was so much emphasis by the um, the certain group in um, in a certain country in Europe, the N O T S E E S, and the Soviets sending envoys. Remember Himmler Himmler did this, uh, sending envoys and at literal legitimate expeditions to Tibet, looking for the philosopher's stone and for the the holy grail, etc. Right. And I think that that is probably because, I mean, obviously we know that Blavatsky and, and Theosophy had a, a major influence on the, um, the tool society in Germany and all these, uh, occult groups. And I think that that is, that is a huge part of it. Now for more on that, you're going to have to see Rachel, um, based homeschool mom, who is an expert on, on especially the Soviet expeditions. Um, and we'll see more of that in the future. Among those stirred by Blavatsky was the poet William Butler Yeats, whom we have covered, of course, in detail. Yeats um, would go on to play a critical role in the history of the Golden Dawn and Crowley's own magical development, as we shall see. In an 1892 letter, the poet declared, this is Yeats talking, um, and I've got, 
a few books on Yates and um, esotericism. One is um, one is this book, um, Yates, the Man, the Masks. Um, and of course, he's got his it's a biography of him. I'm talking about es the esoteric, but also uh, his own writing. Um, if I had not made magic my constant study, I would not have written a word of my Blake book. Blake, obviously, we've also covered Blake pretty in depth. Um, and Blake, the Blake, the Gnostic, I mean, pure, pure Gnostic is Blake. Nor would the uh, Countess Kathleen have ever come to exist. The mystical life is the center of all that I do and all that I think and all that I write. It holds to my work the same relation that the philosophy of, of Godwin held to the work of Shelley. And I've always considered myself a voice of what I believe to be a greater renaissance, the, the revolt of the soul against the intellect now beginning in the world. Now, that deals with, you can see parallels with Yeats and Crowley because Crowley was, people knew, I mean, Yeats knew that Crowley was the great beast 666 in terms of his own moniker, right? I'm sure he never, you know, wasted a moment in, in telling people that, or at least in, you know, fostering that as his reputation. But in Yeats's poem, right, in the second coming, um, uh, uh, he says, uh, at what hour the great beast come around at last, right? You can't help but hear echoes in, in that dealing with Crowley. Now, that we've already discussed that poem and how it's about the sort of Gnostic eon and the, um, and, and, you know, surely some revelation is at hand. Yeats's own interpretation of, uh, the second coming and the end of the world or the Crowley and new, new eon, right? Um, Crowley, of course, literally receives his demonic instruction in uh, the Middle East, right? And not only in the Middle East, but in the Great Pyramid, in the Great Pyramid at Giza, Crowley, um, his honeymoon, uh, part of his honeymoon, which was like worldwide, they went to Ceylon, they went to Rangoon, um, I remember Rangoon luge lessons in the summer. We wore meat helmets. <laughs> Do you, what movie is that, you guys? Um, but he has his um, magical. Their honeymoon is in the king's chamber at the Great Pyramid. Now, remember, this was at, at a at a time when um, tourism was such that if you were a member of the establishment, I mean, the, the British controlled Egypt first of all, and. Have you ever seen those photographs? There's a photograph in the book, um, The Decline of the British Empire, uh, which is around this, a little bit, a little bit later than this, but when the British, um, when sort of tourism amongst the establishment took off, people would go to the um, Sphinx and they would chip, uh, they would, they would, you know, drive golf balls off the head of the Sphinx, right? Um, and so it's not unusual that Crowley could, uh, see his way into the king's chamber. And of course, that's where he himself dictated the book of the law. So that deals with the Yates, the Yates uh, uh, idea of this. Um, it says, Yates credited to his, uh, and also the, the widening gyre, turning and turning in the widening gyre, the falcon cannot hear the falconer. The widening gyre is golden dawn language. That's, that's Yates's own language interpretation of the eternal return, the eschaton, and the series of of eons that these guys in the Hermetic tradition saw. Um, Yates credited to his golden dawn years of magical teaching, the training of the astral vision. Quote, that has been perhaps the intellectual chief influence of my life up to perhaps my 40th year. A key difference between Yates and Crowley on page 57 um, as fellow initiates into the golden dawn emerges here. For Crowley, the hope would not, by his own judgment, prove vain. Crowley lacked the humility of Yates, but Crowley's ardor, uh, ardor and capacity for magical practice were the greater. But Yates did not doubt the efficacy of magic. The poet performed a magical healing on his uncle, George Pollocksven, in the period 1894 to 1895. Yates did this. Um, I wonder if Crowley, sir, at Bushwood. Yeah, well, this club sucks. So, 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 sucks. <laughs> Shouts out to Judge Smales. Um, Pops Finn had fallen ill from a polluted. Ah, here we go. 
the poet performed a magical healing. This is Yates performing a magical healing on his uncle. Pollux Finn had fallen ill from a polluted smallpox stabby. Hello? Yates came to his bedside. He was in delirium and with a high temperature. And when I asked what he saw, said red dancing figures. Without saying what I was doing, I used the symbol of water and the divine names connected in the Kabbalistic system with the moon. Presently, he said that he saw a river flowing through the room and sweeping all the red figures away. That's Crowley. I mean, it's Crowley. That's Yates doing that. You guys? Um, okay, page 58 and 59. Uh, this says... Um, there were certain Masonic influences, but the rituals allowed for both fratres and sorores, men and women. The rituals also drew from alchemy, astrology, Kabbalah, and the teachings of Eliphas Levi on the intertwined relationship between the 22 paths of the Kabbalistic tree of life, the Sephiroth, Sephiroth, and the 22 trumps of the tarot deck. Enclosed with them was a cover letter of sorts written in the same cipher, which gave the name and forwarding address of one Fraulein Anna Sprengel, an exalted Rosicrucian who lived in Stuttgart, Germany, and who was a chief adept in a secret society called Die Golden Damerung. In Westcott's translation here, this became the Golden God, right? That's the origin of the name. Between 1887 and 1890, there was an alleged correspondence between Westcott and Sprengel, whose magical motto was Sapiens Demonibitur Asterisk, the wise person will be ruled by the stars, or SDA. Um, of course, uh, the name is the name of the stream. The name that Aleister Crowley chose um, as his magical name and in initiation into uh, the Golden Dawn, of course, was uh, Perturabo, which means I shall endure to the end. Um, and what does that mean? Well, it means I shall endure to the end because he's Crowley is interested in, of course, we know his whole thing is about bringing on the apocalypse. He wants to bring on the apocalypse because he reads Revelation and, se and sees that he thinks he's going to, you know, uh, serve the Antichrist and rule over the earth as some sort of suzerain right, with people as, as slaves, or at least they'll do that in hell, right? Um, but um, also, um, what was I just thinking? Um, but also, um, I shall endure to the end because we, we're still talking about Crowley, right? I mean, they're probably going to continue to talk about him. I mean, if anybody is the sort of, quote, father of the new eon of, you know, degeneracy, right? Would, would it not be him? Um, this says, um, uh, Golden Dawn, um, let's see. Oh, here we go. Secret Chiefs. Unlike Westcott, who made no claims of magical power, Mathers, McGrather, McGrather, McGregor Mathers um, would hold himself forth to the members of the Golden Dawn as one who possessed a living connection to the more than human secret chiefs. There you go. The ultimate source of all occult wisdom. It was this latter claim by Mathers, perhaps, that would compel Crowley, the future prophet, not only to renounce his former teacher, but to revile his name. The connection to the chiefs would be Crowley's own. Um, says... Um, Crowley takes on Gnostic name from Blavatsky via Yates. Uh, and it says, where is that? Um, okay. Uh, page 60. He talks about Yates's own account. Talking about McGregor Mather, Mathers. And it says, Oh, this is McGregor Mathers talking about how he dressed like a Scottish Highlander because he said he felt like a walking flame. Um, according to Yates, Mathers would sometimes spit blood during his magical practices, lived under some great strain, and was prone to drinking on occasion excessive qualities of brandy, though not to drunkenness. Crowley, once he broke with Mathers, would term him a drunk outright. Of course, Crowley is an outright heroin, cocaine, and uh, peyote user. Um at the time, all those things were legal, but, um, you know, and of course Crowley was using them for his magical rituals. Not that that excuses it, but I'm saying, but he obviously, he was a, a, a heroin and cocaine addict. 
I mean, Crowley wrote a whole book about that, right? If you guys, if you guys read, um, I got it right up here. Uh, I'm not going to stand up again. Um, yeah. Diary of a Drug Fiend is Crowley's book on being a heroin cocaine addict in the 1920s. Um, it says, for all of his extravagances, Mathers had retained the trust of his patron, Westcott, who appointed him one of the secret three secret chiefs who would oversee the Golden Dawn. Mathers was to draw up on the basis of the cipher manuscript suitable rituals of the five grades of the outer order. The, these, the names of the, of the grades are Neophyte, Zelator, Practicus, Theoricus, and Philosophus. Each grade was based upon one of the Sephiroth of the Kabbalistic Tree of Life, with attributions extending on to astrology, alchemy, tarot, Hebrew god names, and angelic realms. Uh, hold on a second, baby. And um, let's see. Okay, hold on a second. You guys, I'll be right back. Listen, talk amongst yourselves, okay? I'll be right back. Um, the doggy needs some food and water, okay? So I'll be right back. Talk amongst yourselves, okay? Discuss. I'm feeling for Klempt. Talk amongst yourselves, right? Why do they call it Oval Team, right? Why don't they call it Round Team? Ha! Mixky! Come on now, homeboy! <laughs> it's called the Pentavret, the Queen. The Rothschilds, the Gettys. Um, I haven't seen you guys. I haven't seen the show, the Mike Myers' new show, The Pentavert. I heard it's disappointing. Um, of course, he got that from So I Married an Axe Murder. And that's a great scene in So I Married an Axe Murder. Because the, the Scottish dad in So I Married an Axe Murder is a, is a conspiracy theorist, right? Um, and... And so I don't know. It's pretty cool, but no, I haven't seen I haven't seen the, the show. The Pantavret. Um, speaking of Scottish, there is a movie. There are a couple of movies um, where you know. There's obviously the show Strange Angel, and there you know there are various other guises in which Crowley the character appears. But one that is often overlooked is, and this is my theory. Um, of course, you know Crowley does have a um, li a few living, um, not. Uh, descendants, but, but cousins, he may have descendants, um, but he, but cousins, um, who are alive now, one of whom is that guy, Nathan Crowley, um, who is the, the, um, he's, I think he's a set designer and he did, you know, the dark Knight. he's done like a million movies. Um, I think they are related. And then, but my theory is that, um, this is a theory about a weird thing, you guys, but, um, have you guys ever seen that movie entrapment? with um, Sean Connery and Catherine Zeta-Jones. Um, it's the one where Sean Connery, like, essentially is a laird of a castle, but he's also, you know, a big-time bank robber or whatever, and he recruits Catherine Zeta-Jones. Um, and they end up robbing, like, the Patronus Towers in Malaysia. And I, I, I watched the movie, I think it came out in 99, but I watched it again because I, uh, when I lived in Malaysia for a summer, um, and... Uh, when I was like 25, I think. And, um, you know, also, you know, Catherine Zeta-Jones is not Mexican, right? I mean, because she made her debut in the movie, her film debut in um, Zorro. And so everybody, like, so what that does is puts it in everyone's mind, like, that Catherine Zeta-Jones, like, Zeta is, or Zeta is Mexican, but she's not. She's Welsh, of course. Um, Y'all probably know that. But anyway, um, so... It's in the movie um, Entrapment. It's the one where Catherine Zeta-Jones like it started the scene of having like the laser lights and she's got to do like body contortions and acrobatics to like get around the laser lights, which are the laser lights are like the the 
the alarm system with the, when they're going to break in, right? It's a famous scene. You, you remember it. It's kind of from back in the day. But anyway, but there's a scene in that movie where they're in, they're either in Thailand or Malaysia, and um, their contact is this guy, this Englishman. And there's the scene is, it has to be influenced by Crowley because they go into this thing and it's like all dark and sweaty. And the guy is like kind of fat, but he looks like a, he looks like sort of a goblin demon. And he's sitting there cross, like uh cross, like, like Indian style. And there's this famous picture of Crowley where he's sitting in the exact same pose. And he's got this demonic look on his face and he's bald and he's holding like a, he's holding like a, like a crystal ball, like a, um, you know, like a D crystal ball or something. Um, and, and anyway, that it, it has to be influenced by him. It's like, they're in the same. Yes. A goblin, a demon, a boomer tar. Excuse me. Shouts out to our homeboy. Okay. Out there with the greatest comment ever on that video. Excuse me. Um, also, you know, um, I haven't gotten to this yet, but you know, Alistair, Harry Potter, AKA the story of the young Al Crowley. Um, which I do think there is some truth to that. I don't know if, if I heard that somewhere or if I made it up. Um, but there is a, a story in this book of when um, they were having their like magical battle within the Golden Dawn because Crowley was Crowley had problems with McGregor Mathers and um, and then Yates was sort of on Mathers side and all this stuff. But anyway, um, there is a, a scene in the book where they talk about how um, I think it's McGregor Mathers uh, made a wand, like a magic wand. And it, it's not out of, um, you know, Hollywood the um, or thistle or something. The, the wood is uh, the wand is made of like obsidian or it's either obsidian or it's something. But it says that he walked up and he struck somebody with the wand like, like in like a Harry Potter strike. Right. And d said magic words and that the guy was knocked out. He was in a coma for like 30 hours. Um, anyway, I just thought that was interesting. Um, that also reminds me of, um, of course, uh, Jay, this is JD's point. He found, he found this one in, um, in the Sherlock Holmes, uh, sequel with Robert Downey Jr. Remember, it's got Mark Strong in it, and Mark Strong plays Lord Blackwood, and Lord Blackwood is obviously Aleister Crowley in the in the movie. Um, he does all these black, you know, he does sort of cheap conjurer's tricks, but he and Sherlock Holmes basically figures out that this guy's, you know, he's just using science or whatever. Um, but I think that it's sort of both. He's doing that, um, and I think JD pointed this out that he's doing both. And that he is doing occult rituals. In fact, they're doing a literal ritual the first time you see Lord Blackwood. Um, they're about to like sacrifice this girl, you know, on an altar. And that there's a scene later on though where it was either in the first one or the second one where they um where Sherlock Holmes, you know, Robert Downey Jr. is being chased, and that big, you know, the big mus muscly guy is coming after him, and like he goes into the guy's um his laboratory right and he pulls and he finds like a it's a wand it's a it's basically a wand and when he strikes the guy you know it's it's a lightning rod so the guy flies back so in other words it's like this blavatsky idea of like science and the occult sort of melding into this new thing and of course you know lord blackwood has the he's he like dominates the whatever it is in the movie the order of the ox which is essentially just a skull and bones OTO um, sort of temple of set esque secret society and where they like, you know, they, they are tied in with the establishment and they're trying to take over the empire to usher in the new Eon. Right. Um, let's see. Uh, Miski says stranger Thangs is an ode to number one, AK Lucifer being cast out by L, but the complete inversion. Yeah, what do you guys think of the new Stranger Things? Um, I, I I don't know what you guys thought. I mean, I like Stranger Things, and I understand I understand if people don't like it, and I understand if they don't like the whole thing, or, or even if they're just not interested. I think that you know Jay was talking about this in the recent stream, like the the nostalgia element. Nostalgia, you know, they always say is a is a sort of a cheap thrill or cheap emotion, but 
you can't deny, you know, if you grew up in the eighties, if you're uh, 55 years old, like me, or, you know, you're, you're much younger than that. Um, like, uh, Rachel, I'm not 55, but if you grew up, you know, if you're born in 80 and you grew up then like stranger things is obviously like it, it it's yeah, exactly. Mixy. It's on point. I mean, it, it, everything in it, all the references, especially in the first season are just so they did a really great job with that. And it's true. Right. Um, I thought that the latest season was awesome. I, I really, I really enjoyed the latest season because they kind of went back to what they did in the first season, which is that like a lot of times with these shows, the first season, you can't believe that they're being made. You can't believe that they would actually show this. And they do that for the revelation of the method and all this stuff, you know, like with true detective one or like with twin peaks. Right. And stranger things one is obviously, um, has so many, uh, it's got de the department of energy. It's got MK ultra. It's got Monarch. It's got, you know, this, this whole thing. And then, and of course the opening of the, the CERN hell portal. Um, and I think that, you know, Philadelphia experiment, all this stuff, but I think that the latest one is so good because they really went hard as Sam Tripoli says, they went hard in the paint homeboy. <laughs> uh, shouts out to Tripoli. Uh, no, but like the guy, I, spoiler alert. Okay. Um, the guy, Jay already did this, but the guy, number one, right, is essentially, he is monarch, right? I mean, he's, he's the guy. And of course, he's got a chip. He's got to be unchipped by 11 L and shouts out to Jamie. Shouts out to Jamie um, in Jay and Jamie's original stream on Stranger Things from like 2015. Jamie points out how L is, you know, supposed to be like like a demigod character she's like it, it's also like her name is like an, uh, an occult name um and how 11 is the number of, of magic 11 right is the literally the the symbolism of the number 11 is like yakin and boaz and how she opens the portal and and i think that you know that this one is obviously tied in with west memphis three and with um with uh, Dungeons and Dragons, it sort of tries to, it's weird because it sort of tries to debunk uh, the satanic panic, but at the same time, it literally did happen and it literally happens in the show. Whenever, anytime there's this possession, there's DID, there are these awful uh, events that happen, they're sort of opening these hell mouths or portals into this other world. We get this like sort of soldier for the demiurge in the upside down or the get out world right or hellscape and and i thought that they went really hard i mean i my interpretation of uh the of the doctor uh, martin brenner uh bremer brent brenner or bremer um is that he and the Paul Reiser character represent uh martin orn and george estabrooks i think that you know because the, the first season goes pretty hard into talking about how, you know, they go through the uh, trauma bonding and, and uh, ritual abuse that, that 11 endures. Right. Um, and this one doesn't, this one goes into it, but in a different way, but there is a scene where she remembers being born and she remembers being snatched. And, you know, I think Esther Brooks was, is on record in the white papers talking about that. And of course, Esther Brooks and Martin Orn are the guys who talk about, you know, they can, they can hypnotize, they can split anybody's mind in a second. We're going to talk about that more on the crucible this week. Um, but, uh, how did I get in, into that? Talking about Lord Blackwood, Lord Blackwood, Alistair Crowley, um, how Sherlock Holmes is based on Alistair Crowley. Um, oh, and the, the, the magical battle that occurred within the golden dawn. Um, this says, let's see back to, um, the grades of the golden dawn. Um, page 61 in this book um, passage through these grades as authorized by the secret chiefs would ready the aspirant for a further initiation into the second order, that of the Ordo Rosi Rubii at Aurea Crucis, the Ruby, Ruby Rose and Golden Cross commonly abbreviated to RR at AC, AC also because Aleister Crowley and Antichrist, the domain of practical magic divination and direct astral travel. So the second level of Golden Dawn was about magic, divination, and directed astral, astral travel. Beyond was the third order, the three grades that reflected the three supernal sephiroth of the Tree of Life. 
the realms of the secret chiefs as to whom Westcott Mathers and Woodman were mere reflections, as it were. Never in the course of the Golden Dawn were these three latter grades, Magister, Templi, Magus, and Ipsissimus, bestowed. Uh, Michael Aquino talks about the Ipsissimus um, as a grade in the Temple of Set. He does that literally. Um, remember when, when Michael Aquino was on Oprah and they had that cut out limited hangout guy in the audience who was supposed to be debunking him, but who was obviously a plant meant to, meant to, um, uh, meant to, uh, what's the, what's the word? Um, make ridiculous any criticism of what was going on, especially with um, the Presidio and all that. Um, but it was going on, right? There were, there were tunnels, there were tunnels, right? McMartin. These were the grades that Crowley in the decades to come would claim by way of initiatory rituals of his own devising. In 1888, the initial year of recruitment, again, 1888 here, right? 50, uh, 51 members were enrolled in the Golden Dawn. Within three years, the ranks of the Golden Dawn initiates had swelled to 126, 48 of whom were women. Yates was initiated in um, 1890, making as his magical motto, emblematic of the new self of the initiate, this is Yates's magical motto, demon est deus in versus, the devil is the converse of God, which embodied the Gnostic teaching that the alleged devil of the Bible was in fact the source of true godly wisdom and is in uh, wisdom in this occluded world. In all likelihood, Yates had first encountered this motto in Blavatsky's The Secret Doctrine, in which it, it served as a chapter heading. It was just such a viewpoint that would contribute to Crowley's later branding as a Satanist. Well, because he was, right? I mean, he's a, he's a Gnostic uh, worshiping the Demiurge. The clamor far uh, for more magic led to the creation by Mathers in 1891 of rituals of the Second Order, which had thus far existed in name only. Mathers would claim as his source of inspiration a mysterious adept named Frater Lux at Tenebris, light and darkness, whose real life identity has never been ascertained. Um, Mathers was thus asserting the link between the Ken of even Westcott to the ultimate secret chiefs. Indeed, Mathers now flourished in many respects. There you go with the secret chiefs. Um, and then we get um, uh, Crowley's affair with this woman, Elaine Simpson. Elaine on pages 62 and 63, Elaine Simpson later on, you know, there's the whole thing about Crowley being the dad of Barbara Bush, which I, I honestly, I don't think is, is far fetched um, because of the ties between the occult, the power structure and the, and the elites and the Anglo American establishment. And, um, but he did have an affair. We haven't gotten to that yet, but he did have an affair with this woman, Elaine Simpson, who became one of his scarlet women. And then, um, of course, later on, Crowley had an affair with this lady, um, Susan Strong. And Susan Strong was the wife of a Texas, uh, I think a Texas billionaire. She was a, um, she was an opera singer. Um, she attended uh, meetings at Parliament. She wasn't a a member of parliament, but she attended dinners and meetings at parliament. She was part of the establishment. It would be like Hollywood people having, you know, parties and, and dinners with the white house or whatever. Um, and she was the wife of a Texas billionaire. He had an affair with her. And she was also the daughter. She was the daughter, I think of a Senator, a New York Senator. Um, it talks about, um, Crow, uh, Crowley, Met this guy, Bennett, Alan Bennett, um, when he was initiated in the second order of the Golden Dawn. And, um, oh, Crowley did have this remarkable ability to, uh, di uh, as a diagnostician. Um, for instance, when he was on his, um, on his mountain climb to K, I think it was at K2, um, one of the guys uh, fell seriously ill and, uh, at the time, it was diagnosed as malaria or malarial fever um, because of, you know, that was rampant and they picked it up on the way to the mountain and everybody was diagnosed as such. Right. But Crowley diagnosed that the guy had pulmonary edema and they brought him down from the mountain. They tested him. He didn't have malaria. He did indeed have pulmonary edema. He would have died. And the book talks about how that's interesting because he's one of the first people to ever do that. Um, that 
mountaineers, mountaineering was just such that they didn't climb peaks that high at the time. And they didn't know about that, right? The oxygen starved brain. Also Crowley diagnosed this guy. Um, uh, he had some kind of illness and then Crowley went to his friend, Alan Bennett, and they, they diagnosed the guy with, um, morphine. They gave him, the guy was basically, the guy was going to die and they gave him morphine and then cocaine and it ended up actually saving the guy because if they'd given him the medicine that they was diagnosed to get, he, it would have exacerbated the symptoms and he would have died. Um, but anyway, yeah, Crowley. And then on page 65, um, Crowley, uh, because of Bennett starts taking uh, morphine, opium and cocaine, which is further explored in diary of a drug fiend, the book. Um, Let's see. Somebody just super chatted. Let's see. Let's see what we got here. Somebody just dropping fat chats in here. Again, shouts out to Nick. Appreciate you. Um, shouts out to Sophie. Thank you so much. Appreciate you. Thank you. Who, who drops me that fat chat, um, that fat PayPal. Really appreciate you out there. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much for taking the time to do that and for donating your Hard earned money, money, hard earned money. Really appreciate it. Shouts out to Derek. Thank you so much to Derek for dropping that uh, fat Venmo. Um, he says for books and living. L I V I N. Listen, man, you got it, you guys. You just got to keep living. L I V I N. So thank you. I'm gonna keep living. Thank you, Derek, and appreciate you. And thank you for helping me uh, purchase some books. There's some. So many books that I keep thinking of that I just can't find. I've told you about this library. They're just, um, one of them is uh, Oliver Stone wrote an autobiography of his early years in Nam um, that I can't find. Um, but it's mainly my prose books. But um, but yes, um, and uh, I've had some really good suggestions for things to cover. Um, shouts out to Kim out there. Thank you again um, for uh, supporting me and also for um, recommending Don Quixote. I think I'm going to do Don Quixote. It would that would be a great one to cover because, of course, Cervantes was an exact contemporary of Shakespeare. And even in this book, I was th- I was sitting here reading the book the other day, thinking of for some reason I thought of Don Quixote, and then the name appeared like two pages later um, when I was reading it. Right. So we need to read about that quixotic character. Um, also, um, yeah, I got a couple other books in mind. So anyway, we'll get to those. So thank you for supporting me. Um, anyway, Crowley purchases um, Bolskin house and he, um, he decides he's going to do the uh, Abra melon um, ritual. The Abra melon was the one that I said was, supposedly written by King Solomon it was probably a forgery, but that again, the idea of forgery and lying, it sort of plays into the whole occult anyway. Um, then uh, let's see page, page 78. You okay, baby. Come here. Come here. Page 78. Come here. Page 78. We get Yates describing um, Alistair Crowley. Um, and it says, he described the doings of a fiend in human form, a man who was well known to be an expert in black magic, a man who hung up naked women in cupboards by hooks, which pierced the flesh of their arms. This monster, I may say that there is such a person, though I can by no means go bail for the actuality of any of the misdeeds charged against him. And for some reason, which I do not recollect, taken a dislike to my dark young friend. Hold on, you guys. I'm sorry. Give me one more second, you guys. I'm sorry about that. I'll be right back. Okay. All right, you guys, let's just cover a couple more things. Um, because again, this is just young Crowley. And um, later on, I'm going to get into um, older Crowley. Yeah, she's a sweet girl. So later on, I'm going to get into older Crowley. Um, but for this one, we're just doing um, on page 82 and 83, uh, Crowley um, introduces, let's see, it says, he goes to Mexico and he gets involved in ritual initiation. Um, let's see, it says, 
Thus, he accorded himself on the basis of his work in Mexico and utterly upon his own authority, the exalted 6'5 magical grade of Adeptus Major, no mean step for one who had been a mere neophyte rescued from the darkness two years previously, right from rescued from the darkness in terms of illumination, you know, Luminate Confirm and Ordo Alcayo. And it says the Adeptus Major grade was just below the Adeptus Exemptus grade habited by Mathers himself. So Crowley is almost caught up to this guy, McGregor, McGregor Mathers, who is his sort of antagonist in the Golden Dawn. He's going to take over. His growing sense of independence showed itself also in the founding of a new magical society. According to Crowley, Mathers had bestowed upon him a certain amount of latitude to initiate into the Golden Dawn suitable new candidates who he might encounter on his travels. The latitude was expanded by Crowley into the creation of the Lamp of the Invisible Light, which appears to have had, at most, two members. <laughs> the first was Crowley himself. The second was an elder personage, possibly apocryphal, named Don Jesus Medina, whom Crowley grandly described as a descendant of the great Duke of Armada fame and one of the highest chiefs of Scottish Rite Freemasonry. It's probably true. Having initiated this elder into the LIL, Crowley in turn received from the good Don Jesus accelerated Masonic initiation to the 33rd, the highest degree of the Scottish Rite. So Crowley meets this guy who probably is the guy that he describes. <laughs> And initiates him into the Golden... Uh, he starts a new secret society, a Golden dawn S society, which is what OTO becomes, right? And OTO, of course, uses the trappings of Freemasonry. But, of course, Crowley needs to conquer Freemasonry. So he, he goes right to the 33rd degree by being initiated into it by this other guy. Um, let's see. Uh, it's weird because Crowley on page 96 says, it says, um, Crowley loves the mystical teachings of Christ. He, it, it talks about how at this point in his life, he, you know, if only he had just not been involved in any of this, you know, demonic shit, right. And it had just prayed and pursued Christ and become, you know, and had faith, um, but he he's, he pursues the mystical, it says the mystical teachings of Christ, but he doesn't like the, it says, the husk of exoteric dogma in Christianity. Um, but then he gets involved, he goes to K2, and then he, he learns the, he becomes an adept, basically, um, in Buddhism and Hinduism, which he incorporates into his later rituals. Um at one point, he describes he goes to sleep in Burma, and of course, this probably he went to, probably went to Burma and was uh, loaded on opium. Um, and he experienced during a night, uh, it says, tropical countryside during a night on which the dugout was moored to a tea tree, a most vivid sexual encounter while still fully awake with the Burmese elemental spirit gnat of that tree. As he avowed in his confessions, it was a woman vigorous and intense of passion and purity so marvelous that she abides with me after these many years, as few indeed of her human colleagues. I passed a sleepless night in a continuous sublimity, sublimity of love. So he, 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 he gets sexed up by this, um, this, uh, you know, Burmese Buddhist, um, succubus sex demon in the guise of a you know of a tree which to me indicates the tree which is like essentially also the sephiroth right he's being seduced by the sephiroth is my interpretation and also by the tree of knowledge of good and evil of which he is eaten because he um you know because of his uh affinity for satan right um, it says, um, Crowley plunged again into his poetry, composing the dramatic monologue Ahab. We've covered Moby Dick here in the voice of the biblical king who had flagrantly, um, abandoned the religion of, uh, Jehovah. While Crowley wrote his old friend Bennett, uh, meditated in nearby hut. He becomes, um, he becomes an adept in, um, Tantra, um, Buddhism and, essentially incorporates that later into sex magic, right? Pages 100 and 101, um, he goes to K2, but he insists on beating the Sherpas. Um, and he 
Then he like runs into diplomatic trouble. Somebody can't get through. So he personally contacts Lord Curzon. Curzon was the, um, was the, Ra, uh, what was he, the Raj of India, I think at the time, um, you know, under, uh, because of Victorian influence. Um, and, uh, oh yeah, here's, he, he, he um, saved the guy from pulmonary edema and then again gave him morphine, um, which, which worked. Then he moves on pages one and four and one and five, uh, Crowley moves to Paris and he gets in with the poets, um, with the poets and artists um, in Montparnasse, right? Um, and he meets the sculptor Rodin. He writes a, I think he writes a poem about Rodin's, um, uh, one of his sculptures and Rodin likes it. And then Rodin writes him back and then publishes a review of the poem in the newspaper. Now he was, he claimed to be friends with Rodin and he, I don't know if he was, but he, uh, but he, they certainly knew each other. Um, and Rodin said that he he liked the flowering of violence, if I remember that, um, in uh, Crowley's poem. Um, let's see. Um, yes, and then page 115. So he meets this um, lady, Rose, Rose, who becomes his like main scarlet woman. Um, and she uh, basically they meet. Um, I think they're at Bolskin house, but they get, they, they meet. And then she's like in love with this, you know, she's in love with somebody and then, um, and something happens and then she's going to be um, matched with somebody else by her parents that she doesn't want to be with. So, so then um, Crowley says, well, we can get married. So then they get married, but Crowley like has, just despises her, but they get married just, and then, then they go on this honeymoon and he has no, you know, he, she, he thinks she's a, a dullard and has no intellect. Um, but then like talks about like their sexual, you know, whatever he makes her an adept in terms of sexuality. And then, um, then he is sort of, I, my impression is that he's sort of gaslighting her and doing, uh, initiating her into, uh, a certain, you know, ritualistically initiating her, um, probably applying her with drugs, et cetera, and sort of doing this occult blitz of her mind. And what happens is she then uh, becomes a, she essentially becomes a medium and he, he doesn't trust her. He doesn't think that she's, you know, he's like, she doesn't know anything about Egyptology or any, you know, anything. But what happens is, this is the famous story of what happens is he comes home and she says to him, um, like uh, they are looking for you. And he, so he thinks that the ascended masters have contacted him through Rose. Right. And so then what happens is she starts to speak in tongues essentially, uh, but using occult and ritual language that she would have no idea about, but that he knows. And then she directs him to, she says that she's been contacted by, um, you know, a, a spirit essentially it's a demon and um to go to the king's chamber at the pyramid at exactly noon and to stay for exactly one hour and to write down everything that he that he hears so so this is one of the culminating events in crowley's life so one of the most famous things so crowley does that he does exactly that he takes a swan feathered you know quill and he goes into the king's chamber, sets up a desk, and he has a. Um, he says he has a candle, but he but he blows out the candle, and that the room is still illuminated. Um, and then he hears a voice, um, and the voice is coming from a far corner of the room behind him. And the voice essentially dictates, the voice dictates the book of the law to him, of which the most famous thing, of course, is, "Do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. Love is the law. Love under will." Um, and, and, uh, he writes it all down and he does that for three consecutive days. And then he goes back home or to the hotel or whatever, man, she's hungry. Y'all he goes back to the hotel or whatever. And, um, she tells him, go to the, uh, museum and you'll find your, you'll essentially find who this is. Now he learns that the demon who dictated this is named Iwas. 
but he goes to the to the museum with her and she says keep going and he and he knows that he's looking for Horus um in terms of you know Egyptology he's looking for uh the god the demon Horus and they walk past all these you know um exhibits of Horus and he's thinking like okay good she doesn't know anything right but then she they walk up to like you know the sixth floor or whatever and she points out this slab and she goes, that's it. There he is. And they go up to the slab and there's like a, like a hieroglyphic picture of him and it's exhibit number 666 and it's Horace. So then he's like, oh shit. Um, and then that's where he forms essentially Thelema, right? With Rui, our Kaput, um, Nui, our Kaput um, and Horace. And I forget the other one, but Horace is essentially, you know, the, that's like the ants. That's like the inversion, right? Of the that's like the inversion of the Trinity in terms of uh, Crowley's occult, demonic, ritual uh, religion of the new eon. Okay. So that's, that's where I'm going to end it um, because that's sort of the climax of the first part of, you know, his life. We've discussed um, his early life, his uh, growing up in the Plymouth Brethren. The Plymouth Brethren, again, was a, was a sect that, which, also sets the stage for Crowley's own thing because he uses the trappings and the, the, the language of it and then, and then warps it right for his own thing. Um, and he was highly influenced by that. We talked about the British establishment. We talked about his, some of his connections with uh, poets, artists, writers, sculptors, members of the Royal society. Um, uh, we've talked about Yates. We've talked about um, the Golden Dawn and the the structure of the Golden Dawn. Um, we've talked about the, we've given a sort of esoteric analysis of his early life and of the Golden Dawn. We've talked about his mountaineering career. We didn't get to his mountaineering career uh, in depth in terms of when he became the wickedest man in the world, which was just to gloss over it a little bit, uh, which was essentially they were on the mountain and he told the group that they needed to go, they needed to set up camp and they were there for weeks um, on K2. They needed to set up camp in this one section and then descend a certain way. And they were like, no, we're going to go this other way. And they voted against him. And Crowley said, I have no interest in um, dying. Um, so I'm going to camp over here because I know that I know that you're going to die. And then they set up camp over there. And then the next morning, he's, basically there was an avalanche that night and they all died. And Crowley talks about how he could hear them screaming. He didn't help them. Um, and he was, you know, smug in his being right about it. And they all died. And then the the uh, expedition, which was notable. I mean, he was a notable mountaineer for his accomplishments before that. But then what happened with this is they went back, they reported it in, I think it was John Bull magazine. And they said, Alistair Crowley, the wickedest man in the world. And you know, ironically or not, um, that is what sort of escalated Crowley in terms of his infamy. And he reveled in that because he is, you know, like we said, he identified with, um, he clearly identified with Satan. We talked about at the beginning, you know, we were going to not debunk the fact that he is, a, you know, a Satanist or not, because he is, um, he, he is even on the surface by his own admission. Now, of course, we've also discussed that he's, a, you know, he's a liar and he's a charlatan, but, the, but again, that's part of my thesis statement is that the charlatan and the lying aspect of Crowley ties in with the, the overriding occult uh, worldview that he has, right? The blinds in writing, the, the secret societies, the um, Argentium Ostrum, the AA, the silver order, of the silver star, the golden dawn, OTO, Freemasonry. Um, and how, you know, he, he wanted to subvert religion um, and the natural order of things to usher in this new eon through his own ritual initiation and, and his own rituals um, in a in a Gnostic uh, paradigm. And we've talked a little bit about, you know, his sex magic and all that stuff and some of the gross stuff. But we'll get into that more in depth in the second part of this, which will be the. There'll probably just be a second part, not a second and a third, even though Crowley's life is sort of three, three um, sections. And yeah, in the books and, and, and the, it's a good point, Jason. I mean, in the books, you know, and Crowley himself describes it as Crowleyanity or, or Crowleyanity, but I think that's, you know, 
and that's, you know, what I guess what you would call, but what you would really call it is essentially the, the, the NWO religion, right? That's what it is. It's, uh, it, and it's essentially just uh, Gnosticism, right? Um, which we see today is pervasive in all forms, in media, in culture, in movies, in government, in politics, in, in the shenanigans and, and the power structure. Um, and it's what Harold Bloom called the American religion, right? Um, this sort of blend of uh, Gnosticism and Pentecostalism, right? So anyway, that's it, you guys. Thank you to everybody who's been here. Thank you um, to all my homies for... Uh, for uh, leaving the links. Thanks to everybody who supported me. I really appreciate you again. Um, and uh, please make sure that you leave a comment afterwards. Even if you just go in there and you're like our homeboy, you know, uh, crispy comment or comment for the algo, just leave something. Uh, you can also, of course, email me at mad maximalism at gmail.com. M a X X two X's mad maximalism at gmail.com with um, ideas, with book ideas uh, or with anything. If you want to drop me some fat, you know, PayPal's Venmo or Cash App, you can do that anytime, especially if you want me to help you with something or work on something literary or whatever. Um, shouts out to uh, all of our homies out there who are uh, doing big things, right? Uh, making big moves. Um, and you guys can, again, catch um, catch uh, me and Jerry on uh, The Crucible um, this coming week with uh, BPF and um, Rachel based home school mom talking about MK ultra, et cetera. You can catch me um, later um, this next week uh, with uh, DPH, our homeboy DPH shouts out to DPH church of the eternal logos, our homeboy. Um, and also of course, make sure you stay, stay dialed in tonight um, for uh, the stream over at Jay's channel, Jay's analysis.com. And um, we're going to watch uh, the uh, old school, legend right uh mark hackard with um beautiful tristana and jay talking about dostoyevsky and uh demons crime and punishment etc so that's all i got you guys um this is gonna be fun and thank you for being here again i appreciate you and keep supporting me please make sure you keep sharing the stream you know our, our subs are going up a little bit we need to get to a thousand we got to get when we get to a thousand subs you guys i promise you we're gonna have a based party OK, it's going to be the one. It's going to be the big party. And we're going to I don't know what we're going to do yet. We're going to have some but we'll have some guests. We'll have we'll have call ins. We'll have uh, some singing. We'll have some jokes, some impressions um, and it'll be fun. So help me get up to a thousand. You guys big shouts out to everybody. Hope you guys have a wonderful Friday night and I love you all. All right. Peace, you guys. Peace.